Motion for debate, Hong Kong, Lord Alton of Liverpool. The purpose of today's debate is to gain a better understanding of why up to two million people have felt compelled to participate in mass popular protests in Hong Kong, to consider how regressive changes in China have created a storm of anxiety, why the UK has a moral and a legal obligation to stand with its people, and how the international community, including the Commonwealth, can provide guarantees to Hong Kong that will give its people an insurance policy of security and solidarity. On over 20 occasions over the past year, I've highlighted the weakening of the guarantees contained in the 1984 Sino-British Joint Declaration, which is, of course, an international treaty, and the disturbing erosion of two systems, one country, along with highlighting the changes in China that would have caused such apprehension in Hong Kong. The Joint Declaration, through the Basic Law, enshrines the fundamental principles of the rule of law, democracy, human rights and free speech. Not just a treaty, but for Hong Kong's people, a way of life now placed gravely at risk. What began as a rejection of Beijing's erosion of the territory's basic law and Carrie Lam's unjust extradition bill has become a broader fight about Hong Kong's autonomy and very future. It's hard to disagree with the proposition that Hong Kong is the new front line in a clash of value systems. In the aftermath of the 1997 handover, Beijing did uphold one country, two systems. But in the last few years, both Hong Kong's freedom and trust have been undermined and eroded in an increasingly dramatic way. The final straw was Beijing's attempt to compromise the judicial system. The people of Hong Kong are well aware of how the Chinese courts administer justice. In 2018, according to the Wall Street Journal, in Jiangsu province, the courts acquitted just 43 people while convicting 96,271. And they're the ones who actually are given a trial, unlike Lam Wing Ki, a bookseller in Hong Kong for 20 years, abducted and incarcerated for eight months and whom I met in Taiwan last month. He told me that highly placed Communist Party officials bought books from him. Without irony, he said his best sellers, including George Orwell's Animal Farm and 1984. The Chinese authorities told Mr. Lam, if we say you have committed a crime, you have committed a crime. Denied all contact with his family and left in degrading conditions, he contemplated suicide. My Lord's belief in the rule of law has been further compromised by Carrie Lam's unenforceable ban on face masks and her decision to invoke emergency powers, always a harbinger of autocracy and the latest in a long list of blunders. Amnesty accuse, accuses the Hong Kong police of points to an alarming pattern of reckless and indiscriminate tactics to beatings and to torture. <coughs> Dominic Raab has called the use of force as being disproportionate with calls for an independent inquiry. The brutality of China's agents was underlined last week when Jimmy Shan, a leading voice for democracy, was viciously attacked by five hammer-wielding assailants. My Lords, you will never create a harmonious and law-abiding society by using agent provocateur, tear gas, iron bars and live ammunition. Shooting teenagers is no solution. The rule of law is not ruled by law, it's simply inflammatory. If all this leads to diplomats issuing a formal warning to businesses in the region, there will be a flight of capital. Beijing would therefore be far wiser to seek dialogue, to seek compromise, rather than killing the goose and the golden egg, China's most profitable financial centre. Over these recent months, I've asked about expulsion of journalists, the banning of political parties, and have worked with Hong Kong Watch, of which I'm a patron, and I particularly thank Luke de Pulford and Ben Rogers for their work and for bringing to Westminster the Umbrella Movement's founders, Nathan Law and Joshua Wong, both of whom are totally committed to peaceful, non-violent protest, but we were jailed, with Nathan disqualified from the legislature. During this debate, we must discuss what the future holds for young people like them and for the city's courageous people. 
173 members of both houses have pressed the Foreign Secretary to lead an international initiative to guarantee second citizenship. The noble Lord, Lord Popat, will say more about this later, and I'll refer to the position of BNO passport holders. But I think it would be helpful to the debate if when the noble Lord, the Minister, comes to reply, he could tell us exactly how many people he believes are currently BNO passport holders. But we'll also hear today from many noble lords with a great love of Hong Kong and its people, not least the noble lord, Lord Patton of Barnes, and my noble friend, Lord Wilson of Tilleon, and from many others with incredible knowledge about Hong Kong and about China. My own Hong Kong connections began as a student volunteer teaching English to families who'd settled in Liverpool, home to one of Britain's oldest Chinese communities. They had escaped from the Cultural Revolution. One of their descendants is my goddaughter. But Liverpool was also the birthplace of William Gladstone, a vociferous opponent of the appalling opium trade, which he said was at variance with justice. The Opium Wars led in 1842 to the Treaty of Nanking, to the opening of the five treaty ports to foreign merchants, and the ceding, of course, of Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Island, to the British Empire. It was in 1980, as a young Liverpool MP, I first visited Hong Kong, and I subsequently went to Shanghai. There, I secretly met persecuted Christians whose bishop, Cardinal Ignatius Kung, had languished for 30 years in Chinese jails. And in 1979, then, it was against this backdrop that Margaret Thatcher had to negotiate with Deng Xiaoping the restitution of Hong Kong. In 1982, Deng told her, I quote, I could walk in and take the whole lot this afternoon. In a characteristic retort, the Prime Minister replied, there's nothing I could do to stop you, but the eyes of the world would now know what China is like. And that is equally true today, my lords. The eyes of the world must stay trained on Hong Kong. Last week, the free world did just that when the United States House of Representatives passed bipartisan four pieces of legislation, three of which were related to Hong Kong. <coughs> But our eyes, my lords, have seen other things too. 30 years ago, in Tiananmen Square, we saw the Red Army massacre 10,000 pro-democracy demonstrators, many of them young. We've also seen how Xi Jinping has been turning the clock back on Deng Xiaoping's welcome attempts at reform. In June, on the 30th anniversary of Tiananmen, the regime said that the brutal suppression of those pro-democracy demonstrations had been good for society, describing it as a vaccination against political instability. And we've also seen how she is repressing political dissent and religious belief. The assault on religion in China is the most systematic since the lethal cultural revolution, when churches were desecrated, looted, turned into storerooms and factories. Religious were incarcerated, tortured, some burnt alive, some sent to labour camps, with Christians publicly paraded through cities and towns, forced to wear cylindrical hats detailing their crime of belief. Over the summer, I met Hong Kong's Cardinal Zen and Martin Lee, founder of Hong Kong's Democratic Party, a meeting which the Chinese authorities tried to stop. I heard fears that religious persecution will be visited again on Hong Kong. President Xi may not yet have a little red book, but he has replaced the Ten Commandments with his sayings, in addition, religious freedom, churches, mosques and temples have been shut or demolished, leaders imprisoned, surveillance cameras installed. The European Parliament described the situation, I quote, as a new low. Writing about surveillance, George Orwell famously said in 1984, Big Brother is watching you, but not, my lords, not just watching. Orwell said, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever and that the most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their own history. For Buddhists in Tibet and Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang, his Sinicization program seeks to do just that. To ensure that their history is obliterated, over 40 of the Uyghur cemeteries have been destroyed and bones of ancestors remains scattered. At the All-Party Party Group, for Uyghurs, of which I'm Vice Chairman, we heard disturbing evidence about the vile incarceration of one million Uyghur Muslims to be re-educated, brainwashed, intimidated and reprogrammed. We've also seen disturbing evidence suggestive of why Uyghur DNA is tested. 
Falun Gong practitioners told a parliamentary hearing how bodies have been turned into a source of forced human organ harvesting. An independent tribunal, chaired by Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, concluded that there is incontrovertible evidence that this has happened. We'll hear more about this from my noble friends, Lady Finlay and Baroness Grey Thompson. The Minister has the names of Chinese officials involved in this and in other forms of persecution. Perhaps he'll tell the House where the Mitzi powers will be used to pursue those culpable. Ministers and their officials need to be alive to China's use of censorship, economic pressure and fear and favour to try and silence criticism and to close the world's eyes to what's happening in Hong Kong. Perry Link, a Princeton academic, describes China's heavy-handed attempts to close and censor debates as, I quote, the anaconda in the chandelier. But the anaconda isn't just in the chandelier, it is the chandelier, my lords. President Xi's great firewall and dystopian cyber sovereignty is entrenched by laws which can result in job loss, years-long prison sentences or exile. This isn't the free air of Hong Kong with unimpeded access to the internet, and Hong Kong has been watching all of this with alarm. In 2008, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, the late Liu Xiaobo, along with hundreds of others, published their pro-democracy and human rights manifesto, Charter 08. He received a sentence of 11 years imprisonment. He wrote that his crime was to oppose systems of government that are dictatorships or monopolies. Opposition, he said, is not equivalent to subversion. He looked to the day when different values, ideas, beliefs and political views can both compete with each other and peacefully coexist. That same thought was captured in the 1984 Joint De Declaration, which said Hong Kong's lifestyle shall remain unchanged for 50 years. This included freedom of the person, the press of assembly, of association, of demonstration and of belief. But we've watched with dismay as promises have been broken, legislators disqualified, mass arrests have taken place, employees dismissed and live ammunition replace any attempt to cultivate dialogue or to find solutions. And we've seen China tell the UK, the only other signatory to a legally binding joint declaration, that we have no right to express a view. We have seen China say that the 1984 treaty is null and void, quotes, a historical document with no practical significance, no binding effect on the Chinese central government management of Hong Kong. So what must we do? The United Kingdom has a unique moral, historic duty to bring together the international community in defence of the rule of law, democracy, free speech and human rights of two systems, one country. We should form an international contact group of like-minded nations to coordinate an international response. And at next year's Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference in Kigali, countries should be urged to give all Hong Kong citizens an insurance policy of second citizenship and a place of abode to be available if China continues to resile on the joint declaration. I chaired a hearing about British National Overseas BNO passport holders, including former police officers and the 250 military who served the Crown. Their plight was said by the late Lord Ashdown to be worse than Windrush. In a letter to me this week, the Home Secretary says that the Government have no plans to amend the law. BNO passport holders are vulnerable, and so are others with proven UK links. Perhaps the Minister will confirm that there's no legal impediment to us giving full British citizenship to those at risk and say whether we'll help to forge a comprehensive international solution for the people of Hong Kong. Nobody wants anyone to have to leave Hong Kong. People are more likely to stay if they know that there will be ways to leave if the need should arise. And my Lords, we should also join the United States in introducing legislation to strengthen the monitoring of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. The Magnitsky sanctions and the enactment of a Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act to hold perpetrators to account when it's been breached. And we should ensure that after Brexit, no free trade agreement is made with Hong Kong or China without a robust clause tied to the freedoms guaranteed in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Trade law is critical and more enforceable than other forms of international law. To conclude, my Lords, the answers to Beijing's fears about separatism and its desire for unity and a stable future are to be found in the free air of Hong Kong, not in the Uyghur education camps of Xinjiang or in a repeat of the massacre at Tiananmen or through, through surveillance cameras or oppression. As Margaret Thatcher rightly said, the eyes of the world are on Hong Kong. 
we must stand in solidarity with them. In our day, we must neither revert our eyes or silence our voices. I beg to move. The question is uh, that this motion be agreed to. <clears throat> My Lords, I do congratulate the noble Lord Alton for giving the House the opportunity to discuss the problems currently that are taking place in Hong Kong. His motion is very commendable and worthy, and certainly the support of this House. Yes, we should encourage uh, support uh, for, for countries that have a better democratic and human rights policies and accept them to their shores uh, and those people from Hong Kong at this time. But where the conflict, my lords, in this case Hong Kong, is the main responsibility surely of this country and it is this country that should be in the forefront of doing what Lord Alton has ably given us to this House to discuss. Um, as there are those, of course, who um, would say in these circumstances they would urge people or other countries outside of Hong Kong from getting involved in a domestic dispute. But, my lords, the conflict does affect many other countries. And, and in this vein, I, would, uh, I was impressed to read in the Washington Post last week how the US Congress is positive in its support for Hong Kong's struggling democracy by promoting legislation advancing both houses, representatives and the Senate to amend the USA Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992, a pillar of the Americans' economic relationship with China and its special administrative region. Until now, the USA has treated the, uh, H, uh, Hong Kong differently from the People's Republic of China for trade purposes, but this is very much under review currently. Under the Human Rights and Democracy Act of 2019, the US Secretary of State will be required to certify whether Hong Kong remains sufficiently autonomous from Beijing to justify treatment under US law, including the degree that Hong Kong's autonomy has uh, been eroded due to the actions of the government of China today. The bill waived under the terms of the Magistri Act require the President of the United States to freeze the US-based aspects of and deny entry to the US by any individual formally responsible for abducting human rights activities in Hong Kong. Surely this lead is very helpful and commendable and puts our own government to some kind of shame as uh, with our responsibilities that were there before the, uh, the handover uh, when we, were the we had the governorship of that Hong Kong. So therefore we, I think, should be in the forefront uh, as a government against these barbaric measures taking place in Hong Kong today. By way of conclusion, because of the, the time factor, I'd like to draw attention to an issue I raised last week in a debate whereby students from mainland China in British universities are bullying and harassing fellow students from Hong Kong who are supporting those who are demonstrating in support of the Sino-British Declaration's initial aims. I did not get a response from the minister then, perhaps I will today, when he wound up. Students at our university should be given proper guidance of freedom of speech as part of their pre-entry to the universities in this country. It's important that students supporting the Beijing government should not bring their standards of speech and tactics to these shores and to our universities. If the government is not prepared to take the lead in defending Hong Kong and others 
at the university. So the obvious leader for that battle for freedom of speech should be the most qualified of all, none other than the noble Lord Patron of Barnes, who I see as his place, because the, he is the Lord Chancellor of the best university in the land, Oxford, <laughs> and I hope he doesn't mind me landing him with another job at this time. My Lords, again, I would like to congratulate Lord Alton, a great advocate of freedom and justice, not only in Hong Kong, but universally. I think my interests are all registered, not least the fact that, um, like uh, my friend, uh, noble Lord, Lord Wilson, I had the privilege of being Governor of Hong Kong for five years, the, the greatest privilege I've ever had. Um, the joint declaration incorporating one country, two systems was an extraordinarily clever, adept way of coping with an issue which was politically and morally difficult both for China and for the United Kingdom. Morally difficult because for China uh, they knew that more than half the population of Hong Kong were refugees from the events in China under a communist regime. Morally difficult for Britain because it was pretty well our only colony that we weren't preparing for independence with democratic structures. When occasionally in the 60s and 70s uh, Britain talked about greater democracy in uh, Hong Kong, Chinese officials, including I think famously Chou Enlai, made it clear that they didn't want that. They didn't want that because uh, it would give people in Hong Kong the idea that they were going to turn out, turn out something like Singapore one day, or Malaysia, an independent country. And moreover, it was always the Chinese government's position that the future of people in Hong Kong was nothing to do with the people of Hong Kong. It all had to be determined by the British and Chinese governments. Nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that for a dozen or more years after 1997, one country, two systems worked extraordinarily well. There was some rowing back by the Chinese government on the pledges they'd made on the introduction of greater democracy in Hong Kong, uh, saying at a number of points that this was a matter for people in Hong Kong. They rode back on that. The joint liaison office, uh, their uh, uh, main uh, point of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, contact in, in Hong Kong, threw its weight around a bit too much. But by and large, things went pretty well. And then I think the caesura in Hong Kong and in the development of China in the last few years has been the uh, election of President Xi Jinping as head of the Communist Party and president of, of China. <coughs> Just as that's changed attitudes to economic matters in China, I think it's had a, an impact on political issues as well. And certainly it's the case that there's been a tightening of uh, Beijing's control over Hong Kong uh, in the last few years. Now that's the backdrop to what has happened since the, since the introduction, extraordinarily foolishly, of the extradition bill, uh, which was seen not just by pro-democracy <coughs> activists in Hong Kong, but by the business community as well as an attempt to dismember the firewall between the rule of law in Hong Kong and whatever it is that passes for the law. Uh, I note what uh, noble Lord, Lord Alton, Alton had to say, what passes for the law in, uh, in mainland China. So we, we had the huge demonstrations, huge demonstrations which began peacefully and unfortunately um, have, had, uh, have developed a violent edge in the, last few, uh, in the last few months. And bear in mind this has been going on for four months now. Uh, I, I would uh, commend to the House an extremely good uh, article written in Asian Affairs by a former a retired uh, Hong Kong police officer about what has happened in dealing with those demonstrations. First of all, he pointed out that uh, starting with the, uh, with the uh, demonstrations on the 12th of June, uh, which were around the government, government buildings, the police began to, um, began to uh, target not just the people who were behaving violently, but a lot of those who were being perfectly peaceful. Secondly, we had the appalling affair uh, in the MTR station uh, and uh, Chun Long uh, in uh, July, when it was plainly the case that triads uh, and other gangsters were used uh, in order to beat up demonstrators and try to help um, in, in, in the policing. 
all those issues uh, and the broader economic and social issues justify establishing a commission of inquiry, and that's been pressed for some months, including by the former Chief Justice Andrew Lee and by others, and I, I do think it's the most sensible way forward. I implore the government to do that in Hong Kong. I implore those who are demonstrating to recognise that they play into the hands of the Communist Party when they're violent. But you have to understand that when you say to them that you'll lose the moral high ground if you behave violently, they say, if we're on the moral high ground, who's going to be there with us? Who's going to be talking to us? Because nobody does address them. Nobody does try to uh, uh, form some sort of consensus uh, with them. So I, I, and they're also, of course, extremely critical of the way that the demonstrations have been policed, which hasn't been um, the greatest uh, example of what used to be, I, I think, and I hope still will be, uh, the uh, behaviour of a, a great Asian police force. I just want to say three things finally. First of all, I implore not just the, um, uh, the, the demonstrators to give up any violence, I implore Beijing to give the uh, government in Hong Kong, whether it's Carrie Lam or anybody else, the elbow room to actually um, make some accommodations with the, with the demonstrators. Secondly, uh, I, I implore the, um, uh, the, the Chinese government to behave more sensibly in general. M most of us have received a rather impertinent letter this morning from the Foreign Ministry, um, uh, which is a very good example of how the Chinese think that international laws, international treaties which they sign, have to be um, followed by everybody else but don't have to be followed by them. Largely, uh, lastly, I refer to, the, to uh, the Foreign Minister saying all this has been whipped up by um, the CIA and, and foreign forces. It's always a weakness of authoritarian regimes, that they don't understand what's actually happening um, below. And that always, always causes difficulty. One final point. I'm sorry to have gone on slightly longer than I should have done. One final point. In 2016, I was in Hong Kong and made a speech saying I'd always support the movements for democracy, but I was totally against um, any efforts to campaign for independence for Hong Kong because it was, it was not going to happen uh, and uh, it would be immoral of me to support that. And Joshua Wong and others said, would you go along and talk to students and say exactly the same thing? And I went and addressed 700 students in Hong Kong University and made those same points. I did the same the following year. Uh, in between time, nobody from the government had talked to them. And at the end of that first session, the student said to me, um, well, it's all very well, Mr. Patton, Governor Patton, you coming along and making those sort of remarks. All very well you doing that. But he said, what happens if the Chinese do continue to squeeze us? What will the rest of the world do? What will you do in Britain? What will the United States do? What will Europe do? What will you do personally? It's a very good question. <laughs> My Lords, it's a, a great honour to follow the noble Lord, Lord Patton of Barnes, not just because of his distinguished governorship of Hong Kong, but of course for the time he spent in Northern Ireland, a place beloved by both him and me, uh, and indeed for his distinguished chancellorship of Oxford University, where I uh, uh, find great intellectual nourishment and, and run a small centre dealing with intractable conflict. It's also uh, a great pleasure always to participate in debates led off and hosted by the noble Lord, Lord Alton, because he brings not only all his passion and enthusiasm, but a thoroughly well-grounded and well-informed speech to start us off. I ask myself what I can usefully contribute after such valuable and insightful and experienced contributions, but I will pick up where the noble Lord, Lord Patton of Barnes, left off. What can we do? And, and ask the noble Lord, the Minister, whether there is any preparedness on the part of uh, Her Majesty's Government to seriously review the whole approach that has been taken to engagement with China over the last 20 years. It was largely informed by a view, I think, that if markets were opened and there was economic engagement with China, that a more liberal democratic approach would, if not inevitably follow, then most likely follow. My Lords, there's a great vogue for evidence-based medicine, 
But if there was any such thing as evidence-based politics, the evidence is clear. Economic openings have not led to liberal democracy. On the contrary, the situation is getting much worse. The noble lord, the minister, in some of the many responsibilities he has within government, has freedom of religion or belief as part of his responsibilities. And as the noble lord, Lord Alton, has pointed out, the situation with respect to freedom of religion or belief in China itself is deteriorating in a quite extraordinary way. And it is not that the Chinese government makes any apology for it or tries to hide it. It is absolutely out front there as part of their policy that unless you follow the beliefs, the culture and the approach of the Chinese government and the Communist Party, you are to be squeezed out. I, I, read, I read words like, their bones would be crushed and thrown aside. My lords, these are incredibly dangerous as well as obnoxious words to be said by anyone. But to, to be said by a head of state and government is unforgivable. And so I want to ask Her Majesty's Government through the Noble Lord the Minister whether we are prepared to review the, that, that approach we have taken. Because when Mr Blair was in government, he was very much of the belief that this was the way to engage. Resources were taken away from many other parts of the world and put into engagement with China because this was the way forward and we couldn't do without it. My Lords, if China believes that that is the case, then anything that we say about Hong Kong or any of the other abuses in China will simply be brushed aside. What does that require? Well, I make one specific proposition, and that is that when it comes to business, our approach to human rights becomes an important agenda item. One of the reasons why Hong Kong was, for at least a period of time, allowed to continue on was because it was the jewel in the crown of economic prospects for China. My lords, I, 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 it is absolutely clear that many businesses are now reassessing whether or not Hong Kong is the place to be, some moving to Singapore, others to other places. But, my lords, it will not do what is necessary if they simply quietly slip away. It is actually important that it is made very clear to Beijing and indeed to the current administration in Hong Kong that businesses will leave, should leave and may well be encouraged to leave if the human rights situation is not improved and more prospects are not given. And finally, I would support the call that at the next Commonwealth meeting, the question is raised as to whether or not, along with other countries, and we will have to take a lead if we are going to ask others, that BNO passport holders will be given the opportunity to relocate. It's not only the best possibility for their future, it's also the best possibility for maintaining them there with some confidence that they have alternatives. I'm grateful for the debate initiated by Lord Alton. There's a very high level of knowledge and expertise within the House, and therefore I make this contribution with some uh, diffidence. But the church in Hong Kong plays a very significant part in, in the life of the community there, uh, where it is distinctive, uh, both in terms of worship and religious freedom, but also in terms of education and social care. Um, Hong Kong has a unique history, and this country has particular responsibilities. <laughs> The parish of St Martin in the Fields, where I was vicar before becoming Bishop of Salisbury, has had a Hong Kong-based congregation, a Cantonese-speaking congregation, for over 50 years. At the handover, there was some anxiety and much hope for a Hong Kong which developed as a special administrative region, was able to look both ways, inside China and out from China, uniquely connecting China to the wider world. We want to stand with the people of Hong Kong. The question is with which people and how. It's a place with, to some extent, competing different views of the world. For mainland Chinese, the pride of the nation's development 
is measured in education, employment, economic prosperity, health care. In Hong Kong, there's a deep commitment to democracy, the rule of law, human rights, religious freedom. And the way in which the protests have been challenged and policed has been exacerbated by the use of artificial intelligence in the visual recognition of protesters, the ban of face masks, and so on. The different views of the world aren't necessarily opposites, but they are very different emphases. And maybe the role of those of us outside is to exert pressure to push together the best of what it is to be human and people together. The current disruption does have its roots in the extradition bill, as well as in housing, income inequality, and the lack of social mobility. But it is much more to do with identity. At the handover, it was assumed by some, for better and for worse, that in time, Hong Kong would lose its distinctiveness. For others, Hong Kong brought something distinctive to Chinese polity, religion, social and economic life. Uh, now, those aged under 35 in Hong Kong see themselves as Hong Kongers first and Chinese second. In other words, Hong Kong's identity has been hardened and has grown more significant, not less. Now, of course, the Anglican Church in Hong Kong condemns violence, but supports lawful and peaceful protests. It's less than helpful from the perspective of Hong Kong leaders for foreign, foreign politicians to tell Hong Kong and Chinese people what to do and how to behave. The task for us is to work out how to exert pressure from outside so that we do stand alongside those to whom we have not just a historic but a present commitment to encourage the keeping of treaties and international law and finding peaceful resolution to the present conflicts. My Lords, it's a great privilege to be able to participate in this debate. For decades, visiting vibrant, colourful, lively, bustling Hong Kong, we've seen rapid change melded with Chinese culture, keeping traditions alive, including music on ancient rare instruments. When Bradbury Hospice opened in 1992, supported by Lady Patton and the Jockey Club, several fine, compassionate doctors sought palliative medicine specialist education through Cardiff and established world-class services founded on deep humanity and high clinical standards, sensitive to Cantonese <coughs> culture. When SARS happened, they cared for those dying and helped contain SARS. My Lords, Cantonese religious traditions, as we've heard, are broad and varied. Some British, interned by the Japanese invaders during the last war, gained inner strength from St John Cathedral Church's ad hoc services. And today, its, its Filipino Christian Fellowship supports those in domestic services. Following handover, Hong Kong's gentle realignment with mainland China became palpable while keeping its own distinct identity. Meanwhile, China has developed at an astonishing rate across all disciplines. To the outsider, China has nothing to fear from Hong Kong, but Hong Kong now fears China, who, who, whose more than 1.4 billion people represent almost 19% of the world's population. In the early 1990s, Falun Gong, with its Buddhist origins and fundamental tenets of truthfulness, compassion and forbearance, was favoured by the People's Republic of China. As it became popular, it was prescribed by the atheistic state, and adherents appear to have been systematically persecuted, imprisoned in labour camps without cause, tortured, and an unknown number killed. They are prisoners of conscience, along with Ouija's, house Christians and Tibetans. Those of us in rich, vibrant societies cannot understand what the perceived threat is to the communist state from people whose philosophy is non-violent and peaceful at all times. Yet now there is extensive evidence that China has been killing its Falun Gong prisoners of conscience to remove organs for commercial human transplantation. 
I recently met Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, Chairman of the Independent Tribunal into Forced Organ Harvesting from Prisoners of Conscience in China, whose judgment makes harrowing reading. That evidence-based judgment, delivered in June this year, followed the earlier interim judgment that, and I quote, the Tribunal's members are certain, unanimously and sure beyond reasonable doubt, that in China, forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience has been practised for a substantial period of time, involving a very substantial number of victims. Is it possible that some doctors could perpetrate such crimes against humanity, even at times taking organs before the person was clinically dead? Shamefully, it seems so. The tribunal's findings cannot be buried along with the bodies of their victims. So will the government support Lord Hunt of King's Heath Bill to cut off demand from any UK residents who want to participate in this transplant tourism? And how do we come to terms with this huge country with whom we work well and trade on a daily basis? We welcome Chinese students to our universities and work with China on many major projects. Cardiff Metropolitan University, that I chair, recently welcomed the Deputy Premier of China and his team to our Food Industry Centre Zero to Five to help China develop public health training programmes in food handling. In many scientific and medical disciplines, there's excellent quality research in research and teaching being undertaken. Collaboration across boundaries should benefit all. Now, as Hong Kong cries out for open government, we have a moral duty to all those British passport holders. It is the strength and integrity of these people that we must not abandon. We're going to lose highly skilled Europeans through Brexit. Yet, Hong Kong British should have open entry to the UK. China has nothing to fear from open ethical practices but much to fear from abusing human rights. Meanwhile, the British people of Hong Kong, living by our code and legal system, must not be abandoned through willful blindness. Yeah. My Lords, I have lived and worked in Hong Kong and have been a frequent visitor to China since the early 1980s. This debate comes at a time when tensions in Hong Kong are extremely high and prospects of greater violence are increasing. Estimates are that up to 10% of the demonstrators are using violence and that these people are well resourced and uncompromising. I see nothing to be gained by raking over the recent events and trying to apportion blame. For every rumour of involvement of PRC undercover agents, there is a counter rumour of CIA interference. This gets us nowhere. The overwhelming priority is to end the violent protests of the extremists who are damaging the very cause that they uphold, as well as at the same time moving quickly to the much needed and unforgivably delayed reforms in Hong Kong. I am a supporter of the joint declaration and the approach of, two, of one country, two systems. This was a substantial victory for common sense and was to the advantage of all sides. Unfortunately, rather than seeing this as a holistic concept, some people have concentrated on one rather than the other, which has led to many of the problems we see today. There is an old Chinese saying which describes this perfectly. Two people sleeping in the same bed, dreaming different dreams. However, on balance, China has adhered to the agreement because it's in the interests of China so to do. Hong Kong remains the preeminent financial center in China and Asia. It is also of paramount importance to Chinese relations with Taiwan going forward. Unless there is a complete breakdown of law and order in Hong Kong, I do not see the likelihood of a Chinese invasion. I also do not believe that if the authorities introduce the necessary reforms, that the structure will change even after 2047. If it works, it's good for China and Hong Kong. The problems in Hong Kong are principally homegrown, in that it has had 
various ineffective governments since, uh, since 1997, which have failed to introduce such much needed reforms in a variety of sectors, both social and structural. Whilst the population of China has become increasingly affluent, the population of Hong Kong, with the exception of the rich, has become poorer and consequently more disaffected. Some of this is due to the dollar peg, which has caused massive asset inflation, which benefits the haves rather than the have-nots. The incompetence of the administration has not been assisted by its poor briefings and overall handling of the media, which sometimes gives a very one-sided view of events. The constitution and performance of LegCo is a big stumbling block. It is less than representative and too pro-Beijing. The composition needs to be changed. The fault is not all that of the government, as at the same time the behaviour of some democratic members has been appalling with outright and needless insults to the very name of China. This lack of respect does no one any good. There is much that needs attention and we in Britain should be clearly pointing this out to the Hong Kong government and these matters are arguably more important than looking at passport issues which hopefully will never be required. If the one country, two systems framework is made to work, uh, it is the overwhelming advantage of both Hong Kong and China. Hong Kongers will have little interest in passports. That's why all our efforts should currently be be directed to, the, to this objective alone. First and foremost, the government must restore law and order by giving its wholesale backing, including resources and training, to the police. The police are the first and only line of civic defence in Hong Kong, unlike other countries. They are fellow Hong Kong citizens speaking Cantonese and with houses and children and, and, uh, and children at the same schools in the community. They are not the PLA, who have none of these features or local relationships. It does not matter, it does not matter where in the civilised world you are. If you stab a policeman carrying out his duty, you are likely to get hurt, as well as arrested, even if you are a 12-year-old. In the current circumstances, now that the government has enacted the emergency law, it needs to enforce it. The implementation of the face mask ban was a farce. The police are already stretched and unless they get full support, disintegration of that force could well begin. There have been no fatalities yet, but that is the way things are headed. Once violent demonstrations are ended and there is a return to peaceful protest, the chief executive can start on the conciliation process with inquiries and measures to reform LegCo and housing and much else. With compromise, good faith and goodwill, and without stirring nationalist sentiments, this can be solved. The Hong Kong government's withdrawal of the extradition bill and its apology for the unintended spraying of paint at the Kowloon Mosque is a good start. My Lords, the Chinese position now that the one country, two systems agreement is obsolete and no longer valid is a clear breach of an international treaty ratified in the UN which enshrined the autonomy, rights and freedoms in the Hong Kong Basic Law. In response to an urgent question on the 26th of September, the Foreign Secretary confirmed that the United Kingdom expected China to live up to its obligations. He confirmed that he had spoken to the Hong Kong Chief Executive, Carrie Lam, and to the Chinese Foreign Minister, Wang Yi, and made clear our concerns about human rights and the mistreatment of those exercising their right to lawful and peaceful protest. My Lords, their concerns should be addressed, not crushed by force. That's a fine and noble sentiment from the Foreign Secretary, but there's scant evidence, more than a month on, of a positive Chinese reaction. However, until, of course, this morning, when it was announced that the extradition bill had been withdrawn, according to the Times, but it's only one of five key demands of the, protest of the protesters. The Foreign Secretary also said that our international partners 
have placed on record their strong support and that the Prime Minister had raised Hong Kong at a recent G7 meeting, where all partners supported the joint declaration and called for an end to violence. The Foreign Secretary stressed to the Chinese Government that it was Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy that guaranteed its future prosperity and success. Again, no positive response from the Chinese. Apart from saying, and I think the Lord Elton has touched on this as well, apart from saying the Sino-British Joint Declaration was an historical document, no longer had any practical significance and did not have any binding effect on the China's, Chinese central government's <coughs> management of Hong Kong. The British, it said, have no sovereignty after the handover, nor power to rule or power to supervise. That's a pretty clear statement, but it's wildly divergent from the fact that the treaty is registered with the UN, remains in force and obliges both signatories to adhere to the terms they agreed. In the meantime, my Lords, over the last several weeks, members have received a steady flow of emails from the Hong Kongers, some setting out their analysis of the situation with great fluency. I'll not give names for fear of retribution, but outstanding arguments so includes, and I quote, unlike other British overseas territories, the British Hong Kong residents were denied a vote on their future. The land and the people were handed over to the Chinese without asking their consent. Another quote. Hong Kong Britons born in British Hong Kong before the handover were British by birth. After the handover, those of Chinese descent had Chinese nationality brutally imposed by Beijing. It's now impossible for them to register as British citizens due to the imposition of Chinese nationality. And final quote, my lords, Beijing is not concerned about the justifiable rights of the Hong Kong people, but only on how to silence opposition views. These are just a sample of some of the many emails that I and others have received appealing for help. My Lord, should the situation in Hong Kong be seen as part of the broader picture of Chinese foreign policy? Most people will be familiar with China's Belt and Road Initiative, a massive infrastructure and investment project, a new Silk Road to transport Chinese goods through the heart of Central Asia and on into Europe, defined a maritime route through and beyond the Indian Ocean, served by a string of naval bases, including in, in Sri Lanka and Djibouti, to protect their passage. My Lord, it, it smacks of imperialism on a global scale, not seen since the 18th and 19th centuries. Chinese foreign policy includes extending territorial claims to a network of disputed islands, reefs and atolls throughout the South China Sea, stretching into the Pacific and closing on Australia. Harbour and airport facilities with military capabilities and defence infrastructure of mushroomed on islands that make up the Paracels and the Spratlys. China has just secured a 75-year renewable lease on the whole of the island of Tulagi in the heart of the Solomon Islands, complete with fully functional naval and air bases initially provided by Allied forces in World War II. Last month, China persuaded the Solomon Islands to join Kiribati in switching diplomatic ties from Taipei to Beijing. There are worries, my lords, particularly in the US and Australia, that these developments provide a foothold for establishing a military presence in their backyard. The annual Bursuma Lima military exercise is currently in full swing, with the intention of five nations combining to provide defense across Asia from a potential Chinese conventional threat, the front line, my lords. The, the Allies' combined power compared to China's is, is um, <laughs> extraordinary. Uh, the details don't bear reading about. But given that military engagement would seem an invidious course of action, we must, my lords, and this is my final point, we must examine combined economic and other actions to persuade China to address the plight of the Hong Kongers. In the Hong Kongers' words, my lords, Hong Kong is not Hong Kong anymore. No freedom, no justice, not safe. Please help to save the Hong Kongers' life. I look forward to the Minister's response. I thank my noble friend Lord Alton for tabling this debate today and his continued interest in this area. My Lords, I'm speaking in this debate partly because the significant number of emails that I've received on this issue, and that was before I put my name down to speak. But also partly I've visited many countries that have been ripped apart by genocide, war and civil unrest, and been fascinated by the evolving relationship between sport and politics as countries transitioned away from the empire into the Commonwealth, and that led to my interest in Hong Kong. 
In real time, I watched the handover of Hong Kong in 1997. Personally, not a word I was very comfortable with when we were talking about people. Um, but I was fascinated by the provisions of the joint declaration and how citizens would be protected in transition and beyond. Many of the lessons I've received, my lords, are from individuals asking for protection and support as a British national overseas citizen. They talk about feeling abandoned and that their only protection is to look to us to hold China to account. Many say they believe we have a historical and moral responsibility to do so. They talk of cases of universal suffrage not being upheld, activists banned from running elections, and of course the impact of religious intolerance. My Lords, there are maybe not many positive things about Brexit, but one of them is, in this country, we have the right to protest in relative safety. And in Hong Kong, we've seen the fear played out on the streets. As I researched this subject, I became aware of the work of Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, distinguished prosecutor and a respected expert in crimes of mass atrocity and forced organ harvesting. Uh, when, on one hand, one could say that China has been at the forefront of medical developments, but we have to consider at what cost. In 2004, in China, there were 13,000 organ transplants. And where are these organs coming from? Well, it's been publicly known for many years and reported in China Daily in August 2009 that approximately 65% of transplanted organs still come from death row prisoners. Which means we back to the work of Sir Geoffrey Nice. In his final judgment of the China Tribunal, he said, forced organ harvesting has been committed for years through China on a significant scale and that Falun Gong practitioners have been one and probably the main source of organ supply. The concerted persecution and medical testing of Uyghurs is more recent and maybe the evidence of forced organ harvesting of this group may emerge in due course. And secondly, that forced organ harvesting continues till this day. We can perhaps understand, my laws, why Chinese transplant professionals and their government chose not to participate in the tribunal. Liu Kang, a spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry, said on the 30th of June, Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China, and Hong Kong's affairs is China's internal affairs. Now that Hong Kong has returned to its motherland for 20 years, the Sino-British Joint Declaration, as a historical document, no longer has any practical significance and does not have any binding effect on the Chinese central government's management of Hong Kong. My Lords, this doesn't fill me with much positive hope. I'd like to ask Her Majesty's Government, is this really acceptable? Where is our moral responsibility? My Lords, I've got a number of friends who've received organ transplants. I've seen them wait. I've seen the pain they and their friends go through. I've seen friends who've passed away. Organ transplantation saves lives. But there is no place for organ tourism, nor for enforced organ harvesting. And this is just one of many fears we must address for the citizens of Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah. My Lords, uh, uh, Hong Kong had everything going for it, including a fabulous future as part of the Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Macau Bay Area, which is des was destined to be and still is destined to be one of the richest, most innovative and powerful regions in the entire planet. My Lords, mention of the um, British National Overseas Passport issue sent me back to my filing covenant where a dusty file reminded me that 24 years ago I had the privilege of leading the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee to a five-day inquiry in the old LegCo in, on Hong Kong Island, um, where we conducted hearings on exactly the same issue, the, the question of whether the, the British national overseas passport should give right of abode to the United Kingdom or not. And we concluded that it should not. We think there were certain categories that certainly should be admitted here <coughs> and have been progressively under quotas since, but we thought the actual passport st status was part of the Declaration, the Sino-British Declaration that had already been signed a year before in 1994 and that we should leave it as part of the Declaration that indeed we should respect the whole Declaration um, because we believed and hoped that it would give Hong Kong 50 years of prosperity and stability uh, which for 20 years it did but now what on earth went wrong? Well we know that extradition law was the, uh, the trigger, the clumsy now will be withdrawn. But in my view, my lords, there is blame that lies in Beijing, in London, and in Hong Kong itself. Um, whether we like it or not, the international legal position is, is clear. Under the uh, declaration and under our agreements, Hong Kong is now a sovereign part of the People's Republic of China. It is in China. 
the joint declaration um, was always based on an understanding that there would be in the future, after the signature, a degree of trust and respect and constant dialogue with Beijing, as well as with Hong Kong authorities, on the necessary reform and modernization which has taken place since. The whole world has been transformed completely since those days. Also, there was a degree of ambiguity and compromise in the declaration. Of course, there had to be. There always is in these complicated situations. And one of our problems is that in the digital age, where everyone is pushed to extremes and, and moderation is cast aside and all nuances are neglected, when there's hyper-communication, it really is very difficult to handle and everyone is driven to um, extreme positions. For instance, now we have really, for, for China to carry on simply asserting uh, that the declaration is null and void and that Britain's got nothing to do with it and should stay out of the picture. Um, and for us, on the other hand, to keep on bravely asserting, which is legally true, that it's a binding agreement, it's just this, these contra-assertions get us nowhere. They are exactly the sort of megaphone diplomacy that the noble Lord Lord Cunnington's father used to uh, warn us against uh, um, a long time, many decades ago. The, there has to be a dialogue of respect and trust. And there has to be understanding. And it, the necessity now, the positive necessity, is for that to be recreated. We said, I think it was Prime Minister John Major said to the people of Hong Kong, we will never forget you. But in fact, we did forget. We forgot the essential dialogue element that was needed to keep the uh, situation under proper control. It is now utterly in China's interests um, to... Um, uh, see that the Hong Kong situation is restored and pacified. It's utterly in the Hong Kong's interest to see that it, re it reassumes its place in the fantastic, fabulous financial future as a hub of the whole world's planetary system of modern government and modern trade. What we need now, I think, really, perhaps the things that live, what we can do, we can urge that there should be a detailed inquiry into all the grievances. It may be that a new chief executive is required to give a new approach to the whole situation. But above all, we need full and continuing dialogue with the PRC, with, with people in, Hong, in Beijing who are not totally ignorant about what is happening, all the dangers for China or anybody else, about the declaration, about what was intended when we signed it, about how it needs to be constantly nurtured and reformed, and that is where we should put all our efforts. This is something we have not done, and now we should start doing it. Um, my Lords, thank you to all for this opportunity to speak. Um, and I am no great expert on, on, on Hong Kong, but I hope to make clear why I wanted to speak today. Uh, previously, I was Chief Constable of Merseyside, which had the claim to the oldest Chinese community in Europe and uh, the largest Chinese arch outside of China. Um, and some great communities there, and a very large community in London, uh, who are always very law-abiding, uh, very integrated with the community, and very supportive of each other, and links historically with the Royal Hong Kong Police, as were and now the Hong Kong Police, as are, and, and trips there. Uh, my Lords, clearly the situation on, on Hong Kong appears to be deteriorating rather than improving. Um, there are large-scale protests on a daily basis and reports of serious violence and damage. My concerns are in relation to the behaviour of the Hong Kong police in dealing with those demonstrations. In passing, I would just remind us, although it has, they have been criticised in Hong Kong for legislation around uh, making it illegal to wear a mask, it is illegal in this country to wear a mask should a person, in certain conditions, refuse to, refuse a refuse to uh, remove a mask on the request of a police officer. So it's not only in Hong Kong that we see this type of legislation. Um, the people, I know just how difficult it is in policing protests. So the people who are protesting are always feeling strongly about the issue they are advocating. And it can make it a serious issue of principle for those people and often involves a passionate commitment to the cause that they espouse. It's usually the case that the majority of a crowd do not wish to be involved in violence. But their presence can be a way for those who do intend to be violent to be hidden and to make it difficult for law enforcement agencies to deal with them. So therefore, my natural sympathies uh, can lie with any police force faced by that type of operation. 
However, I am afraid I have become increasingly concerned by the TV images of the police response in Hong Kong and the reports of respected bodies who observe serious police misconduct and have evidence of human rights abuse. Both Hong Kong Watch and Amnesty International have published worrying accounts of police excesses. As Lord Alton mentioned earlier, uh, a recent Amnesty International report uh, confirmed that an alarming pattern of the Hong Kong police force deploying reckless and indiscriminate tactics in their arrests, as well as beating and torturing people in detention. The same report states, detained people have been severely beaten, and this appears to have been meted out for talking back or being uncooperative. Worryingly, there are repeated reports of sexual violence in police detention. Further, and we've heard again today, there are reports of police firing live ammunition at protesters. Now, I accept that Hong Kong police are armed, uh, and if they become isolated in a crowd, they may use a weapon for self-defence. But I'm afraid the use of a firearm in a political protest is always a very serious development, uh, which increases the risk that the protesters will respond by arming themselves and using firearms in return. And that is always the most serious turn of events politically as well as practically at a particular protest. And finally, we've seen reports of a journalist being shot with a rubber bullet, despite being clearly identified as a member of the press. And so, my laws, the, my questions for the Minister are, what steps are the government taking to make sure that the Hong Kong government do establish an independent judicial inquiry into these abuses? Have the government considered raising the recent breaches of the Human Rights Act uh, included, or the Human Rights Acts, which are captured within the Sino-British Joint Declaration with the UN Security Council? What steps have the government taken to investigate reports of sexual violence against young protesters in detention? And finally, will the government make formal diplomatic representation to raise concerns about all of these issues? My Lords, I am most grateful to my noble friend Lord Alton for bringing this debate and for his ongoing commitment to raising the issues of China and Hong Kong. And I say noble friend advisedly. I haven't slipped into the wrong benches, um, but I think of the noble Lord as a friend. And I am, like the Right Reverend Prelate, speaking with some diffidence this afternoon. Hong Kong is not my area of expertise, and in your Lordship's house, it's always a little bit dangerous to speak from a position of no expertise. And in particular, I'm aware that apart from, apart from former Governors General, we also have young Hong Kongers watching us today. But the reason I agreed to speak was precisely because, like my noble friend Lord Chiji, I started receiving emails. Some of them were emails that probably came to all members of your Lordship's house. One came from somebody I knew, no longer resident in Hong Kong, but somebody that said, I want you to make clear to Parliament what the real situation is like in Hong Kong. My sense is that noble lords contributing to this debate don't need any lessons in what the situation is like in Hong Kong. But I felt there were so many people writing that it was important as an ordinary member of the Lords to take a bit more time to find out what is happening in Hong Kong and at least to raise my voice in support of those people in Hong Kong who are trying to do what so many young people in the United Kingdom want. They want freedom, democracy and autonomy. And after all, what have we been doing for the last three and a half years but trying to talk about freedom, democracy and autonomy, albeit in a slightly different format. So we have a situation with Hong Kong where it is a sui generis case. If what is happening in Hong Kong were happening in mainland China, the Chinese authorities would simply say, this is about our sovereign territory, please go away, we don't interfere in your politics, please don't interfere in ours. But the situation with the Sino-British Joint Declaration is different. So the question for the Minister, or one of my questions for the Minister is, to what extent does the government really feel that it can play a part? Because in answer to my noble friend Baroness Northover on the 7th of October, 
He said that the government is fully committed to upholding Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy and its rights and freedoms as enshrined in the One Country, Two Systems framework. My Lords, how does Her Majesty's Government plan to do this? Because so far we haven't seen much evidence of it. But one of the other areas that I think hasn't been much discussed today is the issue of fake news, but also of suicides. The noble Lord, Lord Carrington said there haven't yet been any fatalities, but various people have said in their emails that what has changed in recent months are the number of unexplained suicides. People who appear to have perhaps fallen from a building, but nobody saw them fall, nobody heard them fall. My Lords, is it possible for Her Majesty's Government to ask what's happening about this and whether the rule of law is being, um, dealt, is being upheld? Because there are very clearly questions about people dying in unexplained circumstances. My Lords, we are in a very difficult time. Several members of your Lordship's House have already mentioned the issue of residency for British nationals overseas. But there is a very clear disparity for Hong Kongers. There are some who have BNO status, there are some who have BOC status, and there are some who will be born after 1997 who don't have either of those statuses. They wouldn't have a right of abode even if Her Majesty's Government decided to give BNO citizens the right to come and reside in the United Kingdom. So what is Her Majesty's Government able to do to think about the rights of Hong Kong citizens? Clearly it's vital that Hong Kong again becomes a place where people want to remain and exercise their rights under the Sino-British Agreement. But if that isn't possible, what guarantees can be given to Hong Kong citizens, whatever their original nationality? Because if we have one country, two systems, there shouldn't be one Hong, three or four different citizenships. My Lords, uh, although I can't claim the same extent of expertise in relation to Hong Kong and China, uh, as many who have spoken so far and from whom we are to hear uh, uh, do, uh, I have had the pleasure of going to Hong Kong on several occasions, and I have friends who live and work there. I was also asked to add my signature to the letter initiated by Hong Kong Watch uh, and sent to the Foreign Secretary recently, uh, and I must say that I welcome the tone of his reply. Uh, but one point arising from the Foreign Secretary's reply to that letter, uh, which I hope my noble friend the Minister can clarify, is, is the reference to his, uh, the Foreign Secretary's, uh, having spoken to a wide range of his counterparts internationally uh, to encourage their support. Does this include the European Union? It, it wasn't listed in the Foreign Secretary's letter, um, and, and we are, after all, still members and can still benefit from a united voice from Europe to carry weight in China. Uh, so I hope uh, that he can tell us that this issue has been raised at that level. I'd also like to hear more about the a reaction from other Commonwealth countries. It's always difficult to know how best to support action against human rights abuses, and some of the horrific examples uh, quoted today uh, and the limitation on freedoms in Hong Kong do require some positive action by the United Kingdom. So in spite of um, the noble Lord, Lord Carrington's advice to the contrary, uh, the suggestion that the United Kingdom should provide an insurance policy of second citizen citizenship and right of abode is one that I support and see as part of our responsibility under the joint declaration. So can my noble friend the minister give us an indication uh, of the numbers involved if this approach should be taken? On the wider issue of the protests, I have mixed feelings and agree with those who consider they've gone on too long and deplore and, and I deplore the increasing violence on, on both sides. At the moment, protests and lengthy demonstrations seem to be springing up all over the world. Witness Chile, Bolivia, Ecuador, Barcelona, and even here in London, 
with the recent paralysis of central London for almost two weeks. So we can all understand how the consequences of such protracted action can Im impact on the lives of ordinary citizens. And however sympathetic one may be about the cause of the protest, patients can one wear thin, and we don't want that to happen in Hong Kong. I do hope, therefore, that we can show tangible support for the grievances of the protesters, and by doing so, encourage them not to further provoke and escalate the violence and disproportionate force that we've all witnessed on our television screens. I congratulate and thank the noble Lord, Lord Alton for giving us this opportunity to show our support for the people of Hong Kong. <clears throat> my Lords, I thank my friend, the noble Lord, Lord Alton, for securing this important debate and ensuring the voices of the supporters of democracy in Hong Kong are heard in this house. My lords, Hong Kong was my second home as I had my office there from 1984 to 1995. And I always found it a very peaceful place. The recent scenes of unrest in Hong Kong have become increasingly disturbing as hostility towards the pro-democracy protesters grows. The ban by the Hong Kong administration on wearing face masks has been counterproductive and only served to increase protests. Many people in Hong Kong believe the umbrella revolution in 2014 did not work and their frustration at the perceived violations to the one country, two systems agreement is growing. As I am sure your Lordship's house <coughs> is aware, the protests began over an extradition treaty that would have allowed citizens of Hong Kong to be extradited to China, which caused alarm, a public outcry and led to the huge conflicts between police and protesters, which has shocked the world. Whilst the bill to enact this legislation has been withdrawn, there are still many issues to be addressed. My lords, both sides, the UK and China, signed up to the Sino-British Joint Declaration Agreement to respect Hong Kong's traditions and way of life. Any actions contrary to the agreement should be swiftly addressed by the UK government. We must do more and fast to ensure democracy in Hong Kong is preserved and that the values of the people hold dear are not eroded beyond all repair. Having an elected administration and not one appointed by the Chinese government so that Hong Kong residents have faith in the running of Hong Kong is a first step. This should be something the UK government insists on happening to achieve real results. Whilst the calls to offer citizenship both here and in other Commonwealth countries to BNO passport holders may help in the short term and I support any moves to do so. It does not resolve the issues faced by Hong Kong residents in the long term. The key issue is the fragility of democracy in Hong Kong at the present time, with more and more stories surfacing of ill treatment by the police toward protesters. The rule of law appears to be being violated. It cannot be right that the police can act with impunity without proper systems in place to hold their behavior to account. My lords, another issue that particularly stands out for me is that there is a need to protect protesting citizens from being targeted by the Hong Kong administration and the Chinese government. Can the minister say what is being done by the government to create dialogue with the protesters 
in order to bring about democratic reform in a reasoned way. But in doing so, ensuring the dialogue is with bona fide protesters and not with infiltrators. This is an important point as it is only through careful and considered dialogue on all sides that we have any hope of bringing the situation to a peaceful resolution. My Lords, I refer to my business interests in Hong Kong and in mainland China as set out in the register. And as someone involved in business in Hong Kong, I record my sadness and concern at the events of recent months. And I also want to add my condolences to all those affected by the news that the 39 citizens of China died in yesterday's appalling lorry tragedy. My Lords, like others in this debate, I too condemn the violence. This has seriously threatened the well-being of the community and has taken a significant toll on the whole of Hong Kong and on its international standing. I strongly support the efforts to restore law and order for the greater good of the Hong Kong people. To move forward, Hong Kong's community needs to work together to restore the confidence of this great city and ensure the well-being and harmony of all its people. My Lords, the rule of law and the one country, two systems principle enshrined in the basic law are fundamental to the strength and stability of Hong Kong. So I would ask my noble friend, the Minister, to confirm that the government's view is that the one country, two systems uh, has worked well over the 22 years since 1997. And would my noble friend also confirm that the government has only identified one case in those 22 years which it believes to have been a breach of the joint declaration. My Lords, Hong Kong has become one of the world's most successful financial and business cities and a city in which many British people and businesses have prospered since 1997. Hong Kong is Asia's dominant equity market and it has become the key conduit for Chinese inbound and outbound investment, including into the UK. So I would urge the government to continue to support and enhance the UK's economic links with Hong Kong. And to that end, would my noble friend the Minister confirm that high priority will be given to a free trade and investment agreement with Hong Kong as part of the UK's post-Brexit trade architecture? And I would also ask my noble friend to confirm that work with Hong Kong under the UK's global financial partnership strategy continues to be a priority. My Lords, it will be for the people and the government of Hong Kong to resolve the very concerning current situation, but the UK can and should play its part in supporting the prosperity of Hong Kong as a great open trading city. To follow Lord Sassoon, who has great business experience in Hong Kong and China. And I do congratulate Lord Alton on a setting the scene for us so well. I recall it was exactly five years ago this month, I think, that I led a similar debate on Hong Kong following what was then known as the umbrella demonstrations, which weren't as serious as they are, have been today in the last four months. As a co-signatory to the international treaty, we clearly have a duty and a responsibility to the people of Gibraltar to take an interest uh, and to express our views constructively about their future. My mind goes back to a weekend in 1984 when, as Minister of State with responsibilities for Hong Kong, <laughs> the Prime Minister asked me to be on duty throughout the weekend because Geoffrey Howe, the Foreign Secretary, was having vital discussions in Beijing with Chinese leaders, including Deng Xiaoping. And I sat waiting for news. And late on that Saturday, the news came from the British ambassador. Deng Xiaoping, he said, had told me that I trust Geoffrey Howe, and therefore I've given an instruction. We go ahead 
to draw up an agreement. Now, trust is at the heart of this, and that is what started the whole process moving forward. To the extent that we then, by the end of the year, signed that joint declaration, which is one of the most remarkable declarations in history of any country, where you have the juxtaposition of two totally different contrasting systems of government. One, an autocracy, the other with relatively free way of life and rule of law. And at that time, and I believe today just as strongly, there is a mutual interest amongst all of us, whether the people of Hong Kong above all, the Chinese government and the British government, to see the successful implementation of that treaty and the base law that goes with it. It seems to me that Hong Kong is facing one of the biggest challenges ever in their history. They've been through the 1967 Cultural Revolution, the 1984 anxieties about their future, the 1990s and all that transition, and the Umbrella Revolution. But this seems to be even more deep. And clearly the young people are frustrated and worried about their future, their freedom, but their jobs and their housing and the contrast between the wealthy and the less well-off. Alongside that, we've already heard that China today, under President Xi, has stronger political and security control in that country. And then in Hong Kong itself, we've had a lack of political leadership by successive chief executives, and therefore a lack of confidence and of trust. So what needs to be done? First of all, I think, it would be sensible for Hong Kong to have a sharp look at the way in which they choose chief executives. The basic law allows uh, the uh, system to be devised in such a way that a chief executive can be elected who is directly accountable to the people. But if, as is the present time, the means of appointing and electing a chief executive is through a body of 1,200 people largely leaning towards Beijing and with candidates who have to have Beijing's approval, there is a bound to be a large element of mistrust and that needs, I believe, looking at. Then there's a question of an independent inquiry on the police which I hope would restore confidence in the police. For the young, there needs to be improvement in their housing, in their conditions, the opportunities for their jobs and I hope businesses in Hong Kong will help them in that respect. On citizenship, I have only one point. Not that we need to dwell on the broader issue, but there is one group of people, 260 of them, Hong Kong former servicemen who served in the armed forces under the British Crown, who are getting extremely nervous about their own position and their own security. And this is a matter that's been raised by Parliament on regular occasions but with the Home Secretary. I'd be very grateful for the Minister's, state, uh, minister's view about whether they can be given right of a vote. What, therefore, I believe is needed, and what we should encourage, because we can't dictate or we can do to persuade, is sustained dialogue in Hong Kong so that they can strengthen all that is embodied in the framework of the, of the Joint Declaration and the basic law, with imaginative leadership and with us encouraging the international community to support them. That's the least we can do for the people of Hong Kong. My Lord, I refer the House to my entry in the Register of Interest. I do congratulate the noble Lord, Lord Alton, in introducing this debate. He has long been a beacon of morality in the, your Lordship's House. I first went to work in Hong Kong in 1961, and I've made numerous visits there over the last 58 years, most recently in May last year. In 1975, when I was a journalist, The Economist sent me to write a survey of Hong Kong, for which I had the most generous guidance from Sir Murray McElhose. Sir Murray was Hong Kong's longest serving, hugely respected, and in the view of many greatest governors of Hong Kong, 
He served four terms from 1971 to 1982. And from 1982, of course, he was a distinguished member of your Lordship's house. I'd also like to pay tributes to my noble friend, Lord Patton, whose governorship I was able to observe quite close. Uh, and I have particularly two bits of his legacy, which are especially relevant. First of all, during that period in the run-up to the handover, he focused the eyes of the world on Hong Kong. And secondly, he taught the people of Hong Kong how to stand up for themselves. I refer to Lord McElhurst because together with Sir Philip Haddon Cave, the financial secretary, he oversaw the development of Hong Kong from a trading outpost of the British Empire to a flourishing city-state. He did so by advocating the interests of Hong Kong in London, and that was during the height of a period of the British political struggle between socialism and capitalism. This aspect of the role of the British governor is, I believe, a clue to the cause of the tragic events over the last five months in Hong Kong. Under the very imaginative formula of one country, two systems, Hong Kong has for 20 years had a chief executive. And as my neighbor friend, as the neighbor Lord, Lord Luce explained, he's selected effectively after some sort of consultation um, by Hong, by, with Hong Kong, but under, really, by Beijing. Unfortunately, each of the um, chief executives has been perceived by Hong Kongers as representing the interests of Beijing in Hong Kong, yeah. rather than being an advocate for Hong Kong to a leadership of Beijing. Yeah. Indeed, Carrie Lam seems to have tried to anticipate what will please Beijing. That seems to be how the disastrous extradition bill was conceived. The obvious sensitivities should have excluded such a provocative initiative, especially as we gather it was not actually initiated by Beijing. And when the storm first burst, it should have been withdrawn immediately, instead of which matters have been allowed to drag on and indeed deteriorate for some months. During this period, Beijing has actually been remarkably restrained, uh, rightly so in their own interest. And I do have sympathy with the uh, Hong Kong police, although they have behaved perfectly. The initial protests were wholly justified, but the escalation into violence was not. It has become counterproductive to the cause and concern of the protesters. Rather, I may say, in the way that the actions at Canning Town Tube Station last week have been for ex Extinction Rebellion. But let us face the fact that for another 28 years, the, we will have a system of one country, two systems. And the regime is not likely to mean full democracy for Hong Kong, and certainly not any form of independence. Beijing was fortunate to inherit the world's third most important financial center. And for China, that was indeed a treasure. While Shanghai is a world-class commercial center, it is not under starters orders as a global financial center to replace Hong Kong. There are many reasons for this. Perhaps the most obvious is that in China, the judiciary is under control of the Communist Party and will remain so. The only challenge to Hong Kong's financial role comes from Singapore. My Lords, Mrs. Lam should be allowed to retire. China's leadership, which means Zing, Mr. Zing, President Zing, should rise to the challenge of appointing a successor who can acquire and maintain the trust and respect of the people of Hong Kong without forfeiting the confidence of Beijing. My Lords, I commend the noble Lord Alton for giving this House the opportunity for this debate. And the depth of this debate is testimony to the continuing close ties between the UK and Hong Kong. I was warned by a veteran staffer in the office of Caroline Lucas 
to beware of becoming involved in too many issues of foreign affairs, because there are so many. The human needs are so pressing that they can quickly consume every hour of your day and more. So many tragedies around the world have a British link, for the disastrous history of British colonialism continues to play out in the current day, as well as the destructive and counterproductive policies of military adventurism in Iraq and Afghanistan. But the issue of Hong Kong is one to which I have a personal tie. As a young journalist, I oversaw the Bangkok Post's coverage of the Hong Kong handover, now more than 22 years ago. And the young people engaged in the struggle for democracy in Hong Kong have much in common with the climate strikers here in the UK, young people whose elders have failed them and are now bravely taking the future into their own hands. <coughs> like many other members of this House, I've been contacted by multiple individuals asking that Britain both acknowledge and act on the actions of the Hong Kong and Chinese authorities and the state of repression and fear in Hong Kong. I could not resist their calls. Back in 1997, I thought that the British would stand up for the democratic rights of the people of Hong Kong. I remember being shocked by the final agreement. And I think the words of the noble lady Baroness Grey Thompson earlier talking about how the idea of handing over people is deeply disturbing really sums up how I thought at that time. We, as a nation, do bear responsibility for the state of Hong Kong today. And that, as here we have heard from so many noble lords, is a frightening breakdown of the rule of law and abuses by officialdom of their power and resources. The noble lord, Lord Alton's motion, calls on us to note the political unrest. I want to go much further than that. I want to condemn the clear human rights abuses and repression that is occurring and call for the British government to take concrete action. I will quote a few words from a woman <coughs> who I'm not naming for obvious reasons, who describes herself as an ordinary working mother who's experiencing the worst moment of my life. This reflects the accounts from the noble lady, Baroness Smith. This mother in Hong Kong speaks of living in a city where floating corpses, sometimes decapitated, are being found in the sea and alleged suicides in and around residential buildings, with police culpability widely thought to be involved, a city where people are understandably feeling, as this mother says, hopeless. Reference has been made to the report this week from Stand with Hong Kong, a report on the conditions in the San Uk Ling detention facility and the broader treatment of protesters by police. These are deeply disturbing reports of beatings, of sexual violence against young women, of denial of medical treatment. So what should we do? I will aim always, when I stand up in the House, not to simply condemn, but to ask for action. Surprisingly, we can actually look to the United States of America to see the kind of action that could be taken. The House of Representatives has passed, and the Senate is expected to pass, the bills condemning China's actions and supporting the right to protest in Hong Kong and also requiring annual reviews of Hong Kong's special economic and trade status. It's thought that the numbers exist to override any potential veto by Donald Trump of those bills. I would hope that we could at least match this action <coughs> in the UK. In Germany, the Foreign Minister met with a visiting Hong Kong activist to hear his concerns. I would hope that our government would do likewise, should a request for a similar meeting be made. And of course, there is the special issue that Lord Alton arose, arose about the holders of British national overseas passports. Britain cannot simply abandon these people. The joint declaration on the question of Hong Kong, agreed two decades ago, contains no enforcement provisions. But the government this year, in response to a question from Caroline Lucas, the one referred to by Lord Chigley, said, that it accepted China had breached its obligations under the Joint Declaration, that this would be a bilateral matter between us and China, and the government said we would pursue it accordingly. Given 
the re widely reported state of Hong Kong today, the abusive behaviour of the police on the streets, the dreadful treatment of prisoners and the deaths linked to official action. I look forward to hearing from the local Lord, the min Minister, about what action the government is planning to take. Yeah. My Lords, I want to thank Lord Alton for tabling this very timely debate and refer to my register of interests, to my role today as the chair of the uh, Hong Kong subgroup of the APPG on China, and to my being a British-born Chinese from Hong Kong. The unrest in Hong Kong lately has been a cause of great concern to me personally and those close to me. It's a beautiful place. Its people possess, in my view, a tremendous calling, not just to generate wealth and to be an entrepot between mainland China and the rest of the world, but also to be a source of people, ideas and resources for the world. My own ancestors left the village in Zhongshan, just across the border after 23 generations, via Hong Kong to the rest of the world to join our global diaspora, like millions of others, by sea and air. So it's especially heartbreaking to see the violence that has arisen on both sides of the divide in Hong Kong, in the streets and over the airwaves, as the city turns in on itself, even as the, as the world watches. This reflects a wider trend, I believe globally, where it seems disagreement, fueled by the internet, as well as economic and political factors, is stretching, stretching our governance arrangements to the limit. In our own constitution, the situation in the US, Northern Ireland, or indeed Hong Kong and its one country, two systems model. It seems the hardest thing in the world right now is how to share power peacefully, whether you're being called to give some of it away or whether you want more of it. Evidently, the status quo everywhere needs to adapt. And that is true even of the situation here in Westminster. But the question is always, what do we change the system into? As we well know, constitutional reform requires time to do it well, to listen to all parties and views, and the unintended consequences of change can be severe further down the track. But to resort to violence seems to mitigate against carefully considered reform. All sides in the conflict in Hong Kong, I believe, need to explore non-violent ways to move ahead and show restraint. And I know many do, and they ought to be applauded. Because the violence, in my view, distracts from the real issues that need to be addressed around the world, whether around rising costs of living, the creation of laws that infringe on individual freedom, especially of conscience or belief, intergenerational inequality, and increasing monopolies of land, technology, and talent. Doing nothing is not the answer to addressing these issues. Nor, sadly enough, as we can see in the UK itself, is greater democracy in its current form necessarily a full-blown panacea to addressing the challenges we have here, which mirror those in Hong Kong and elsewhere. The best way forward is for those who have the means and influence to help instigate change at the local level by bringing in responses based on truly listening to those who are protesting and the condition of the silent masses who sympathise with them. For example, how do we quickly build more affordable housing? I would refer to the Bristol Housing Festival, which I am involved with, for a local UK response. How do we give our young people more hope and better jobs and opportunities and empowerment in their lives generally? And how do we curtail monopoly and monopsony domination of our markets? Indeed, an era is coming soon when we will need to upgrade democracy itself. Our current model favours majorities over minorities and incumbents over ent new entrants. But in the age of the internet and social media, a minority or new challenger that loses in our current democracy is no longer always content to let the matter rest. We need mechanisms to involve people and to get consent and buy-in at every level, not just at the headline majoritarian stage or in our formal legislatures. This is true in Northern Ireland, in Asia, as well as in the US and around the world. Personally, I favour asking people not just who they like or what idea they like, which is expressed in our current populist representative democracy and referendum model, which we've inherited over the century and decades ago but asking people directly as well what they think will work and allocating resources accordingly. The top line questions arising from this debate that I've, uh, I have chosen so far not to fully engage with, since I believe to focus on them is to miss the essential issue, which is how places like Hong Kong can become better environments in which to live, places in which their citizens can feel they have a future, where no one is left behind or becomes so frustrated that they're tempted to rise up violently. Should we give all Hong Kong citizens full passports? That depends on if doing so would help increase the peace and address the future of Hong Kong, or risk antagonising an already tense and volatile situation. Should the UK take a stronger stance with China on human rights abuses and back all pro-democracy protesters in the streets? The UK has been clear about its position on human rights and has already made known its concerns about police conduct and rightly called for an inquiry, and on the rule of law and on the rising constraints on freedom in the region. The question is whether violent confrontation is the most effective way to address and convey these concerns, or whether there are other ways to help all our citizens have better lives. 
I was encouraged, for example, when one of the developers in Hong Kong recently donated 3 million square feet of land to the government to create affordable housing. It's a first practical step to change. While reform of governance is vitally important, the urgent way forward in many parts of the world is how we bring immediate and long-term relief to workers and young people who have suffered a decline in wages in real terms over the last 20 years or more, compounded by rising housing and living costs. Only innovative and radical action by those who have the land, money and people resources can move the dial, working with both protest groups as well as with government. It's happened in the past in our country, with Cadbury, Shaftesbury, Spen and Lewis who founded the John Lewis model. Without them, we could well have suffered a bloody revolution here. We need similar Asian reformers now to step up and take their place in history. My Lords, I too want to thought, thank the noble Lord, Lord Alton of Liverpool, who is enduring in his ability to make us have a conscience in this House. I hope he continues to do so. And as my own relationship with Hong Kong began when, in 1976, I was taken on a tour of Southeast Asia by my mother, the highlight of which was a week in Hong Kong. Nearly a decade later, the Hong Kong handover and the plight of Hong Kong citizens was the reason, as a new, newly naturalised Briton, I instantly became a political activist, driven by Paddy Ashton's passion for the rights of Hong Kong Chinese. That support for Hong Kong's people also pulled me to go there and support the umbrella protests in 2014. The remarkable determination of a new generation of young people, so clearly expressing their, their identity, <coughs> in the face of retreating rights, was a revelation that enables me to understand what's happening there now. First, although housing and jobs may be important, the movement now is about much more than economics. It's about identity and a political culture. That's Chinese, that, that is the Chinese government's first miscalculation. The Chinese believe their plans for building an economic powerhouse in the Guangdong, Hong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, which is intended to rival Silicon Valley, Tokyo, and New York, will tie Hong Kongers into the Chinese dream. Uh, in other words, to subsume them into Greater China. They hope that young people will be enticed by the trade-off they offer, where consumption is a proxy for freedom. China's second miscalculation is to keep Mrs. Lam in office. For all her attempts at resolving the situation, it is too little, too late, and her credibility, such that it, it was, is entirely short. There has been a profound miscalculation on China's part, starting with the abductions of the staff of Causeway Books, that China can act with impunity, prioritising its own interpretation of the basic law. A further miscalculation is Beijing's increasing use of its powers to interpret the basic law, eroding the independence of Hong Kong judges. So, as the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and the other places said, it is starting to be one country, one and a half systems. This loss of confidence in their constitution is surely fueling the protesters' anger. Who wouldn't fight for their future when they only have to look at Xinjiang province to see what it means to be a minority in China? Apropos Mrs. Lam, a wiser government in Beijing would see that a more pragmatic person, given some slack from Beijing, may be better able to start a confidence-building exercise so necessary for a political resolution of these issues. So what is the UK's role in revolving this? I refer to the calls today for people of BNO status to be given indefinite leave to remain. But unilateralism, in my view, is not the answer to the UK's obligations. What is needed is an insurance policy for a significant number of countries to act together to provide those assurances. In a case like this, multilateralism is the only way to send, if we want, a message to China. My Lords, we are too diminished a power to be able to make a difference on our own. So I'd ask the Minister to assure us that he's working with the European Union, the Commonwealth, as well as with the US to advance the interests of Hong Kong citizens. But I also think it's a mistake to believe that these brave young people necessarily want to move abroad. They're fighting for their future in their own land, not somewhere else. They wish to remain within their culture, their identity group, and above all, not to let their other fellow protesters down by taking the ladder up when those remain behind. 
So the UK must do its best to provide such safety nets as it can, but above all to marshal its resources for a coordinated and joint response with all other like-minded countries. It should convince its friends and partners that if a bully can run riot at home, then he'll run riot in his neighbourhood, then eventually more widely. It's not simply a matter for the UK, but for the whole of the international community. My, Lords, my final thought goes to Lord Patton of Barnes's pivotal question, the question that the students put to him about what will happen if China continues tightening the screws. And I think the answer there lies with China as well as with us. The regression in China's political trajectory is less than a decade old. Xi Jinping has only been in power for six years. He hasn't abolished, while he's abolished term limits, he hasn't abolished um, longevity itself. He hasn't found the elixir to life yet. 2027, which is uh, 2047, which is 28 years away, is still a generation away. China may yet pivot away from its current trajectories. It is for us and the rest of the inter international community to ensure that it does so. <coughs> My Lords, I too wish to pay tribute to the noble Lord, Lord Alton, for bringing this uh, timely and necessary debate and for his continued work in championing human rights. We heard today that Hong Kong is an amazing place, a global centre for trade that has thrived for decades. It is like many Britain, with its law of trade and commerce, the commitment to democracy and the relentless work ethic and importance of education. The residents of Hong Kong should have no reason to be concerned. After all, the articles in the Joint Declaration agreed between Britain and China guarantee the people of Hong Kong their rights to economic and political independence for a period of 50 years following 1997. Yet, that is not the case. And when you hear that the Chinese Foreign Ministry called the treaty merely a historical document, that no longer has any practical significance. It is no wonder the people of Hong Kong are so distressed and fearing for their livelihoods. My noble friend, Lord Patton Barnes, said extradition bill earlier this year was a tipping point with millions of Hong Kong residents taking to the streets before it became too late. Many of those protesters have said they consider themselves more British than Chinese. They have gathered outside the British consulate singing, God save the Queen. These protesters want to escape the darkness of communism and bask in the light of democracy. And they are risking their own lives to send us that message. We cannot and should not ignore them. My Lords, the making of modern China as a global power is because of how they copied Hong Kong's success on a wider scale, opening up their markets to the world. Over the past decade, Britain has built strong relations with China and has considerable goodwill in China, perhaps helped by our £60 billion trade deficit with them. My noble friend, Lord Howell, often says that Commonwealth are our family, and I strongly believe that applies to the residents of Hong Kong. I am very much in agreement with those organisations and members of both houses that have said that Britain and the Commonwealth should play a very proactive role in protecting the residents of Hong Kong and offering them an alternative to remaining in their current homes, ideally giving them second citizenship. In 1997, Hong Kong residents could apply for a British national overseas status, giving the re those residents a right to UK passport, but not the right to live or work in the UK. <coughs> my Lords, I can hear the echoes of my own history in this predicament. We, Ugandan nations, were British overseas citizen passport holders, which included subset known as British protected passports. When we were expelled by the brutal dictator Idi Amin, this status was our lifeline, our greatest gift. 
The situation facing the residents of Hong Kong is very familiar to me, and I'm drawn to the steps the then Prime Minister Edward Heath took in the face of considerable opposition to the Ugandan nations. This country welcomed 28,000 Ugandan nations. 19,000 Ugandan nations who are stateless were welcomed by the Commonwealth countries, including Canada taking 5,000, Australia taking 2,000, New Zealand taking 2,000, and some parts of the European Union. Heath ruled that Britain had a legal and moral responsibility to take in those British passports, saying this is our duty. There can be no excuse that being expelled from the country, which in many cases is a land of their birth. They are entitled to come here and they will be welcome here. I strongly urge the government to take the inspiration from those words today and to ensure that if the situation does not improve in Hong Kong, these residents will be guaranteed a home in either Britain as well as other Commonwealth countries. There can be no excuse. These are British nationals and our family. They need our support and deserve our compassion. These are English-speaking, highly educated people who are entrepreneurs by nature. They will be a tremendous asset to Britain or any Commonwealth country. When the Ugandan Asians arrived in Britain, we were given the warmest of welcomes and have never wavered in our loyalty to Britain. I am convinced the same situation will arise again if we open our homes and our hearts to the people of Hong Kong. My Lords, um, I come at the end of a long list of distinguished speakers. Two things uh, are evident from that. One is that in your Lordship's house there is a great deal of personal experience of Hong Kong, people who have lived there, people who have worked there. There is also a universal uh, affection for Hong Kong and the people of Hong Kong. And there is universally deep concern about what has been happening in Hong Kong over the last few weeks. And that surely can be no surprise. Weeks of demonstrations which initially started very peacefully with um, the majority of people, young people, who were clearly um, well-intentioned, very concerned about their own future, possibly not well-informed about what they might reasonably achieve, but with, with good intentions. And then increasing amount of, of violence. And that is a very distressing thing to see, uh, not at all the way in which Hong Kong usually acts, going to be totally counterproductive and something which should not be tolerated. There's no occurrence that I can think of in Hong Kong of that degree of violence since, well, 50 years ago, uh, 1967, during the Cultural Revolution, when there was very serious violence in Hong Kong. And then, incidentally, the Hong Kong police behaved with great steadfastness. Indeed, at the end of that year, so well had the Hong Kong police behaved that they were given the accolade of being called the Royal Hong Kong Police. Now, there's been a good deal of criticism of the police recently, and some of your lordships have shared that criticism. Um, I noticed that my noble friend, Lord Hogan Howe, could see how difficult it is to carry out those sort of operations, and also probably how mistakes can be make and made, and those sort of mistakes need to be remedied. But it's worth remembering, I think, that not only have the police been under enormous strain week after week, weekend after week, but their families have also been threatened, their children going to school have been threatened, um, and their position has been extremely difficult. My Lords, I think it is clear enough that all of what has been going on is not just a consequence of the so-called extradition bill, the um, Fugitive Offenders Ordinance, as it's really properly called, widely mis misunderstood as it has been. I think a majority of those taking part in the demonstration sincerely believed they might be picked up for something they'd said about the Chinese leadership and sent to mainland China for trial. Now, of course, it was extradition 
for alleged offences in mainland China, not picking up somebody who had allegedly done something in Hong Kong. And the people who were, in a way, rightly concerned were business people going into China who feared that there might be some artificial accusation against them by rivals, which would en enable there to be a demand for them to be extradited to China. It was an ill-conceived measure. Um, it is in the too difficult box, to put it mildly, uh, and was not a sensible idea to put forward. But I think what it, what it showed was that there was a great pile of dry timber in Hong Kong, and the extradition bill was the light that set that on fire, and it's remained on fire. Noble Lords have referred to a number of the concerns that young people have about housing, about job opportunities, about their freedoms, about what simply would happen to them in the future. Uh, would they lose some of the privileges they've got at the moment? And behind, I think behind a lot of that has been a growing concern and worry about the extent of mainland China's involvement in Hong Kong. It's, it's not, a, not a simple issue. Um, my impression is that what tends to happen is that when there's a period of confusion in Hong Kong and uncertainty about what's happening, all sorts of different organizations in mainland China send their representatives into Hong Kong to find out what's happening, to influence what's happening if they can. And that begins to build up into a picture of much greater involvement in Hong Kong than should be the case. At, at the time of the signing of the joint declaration, there was a strapline or a, a slogan which was often put out from Peking, which was Gang Ren Zhi Gang, which I'll translate as Hong Kong people running Hong Kong. That, that seems to me to be an admirable objective. That was what it was said was going to be the future of Hong Kong after the implementation of the Joint Declaration, after the transfer of sovereignty. But what it, what it needs is for the Hong Kong government to be effective in what it's doing, the Hong Kong Legislative Council to be effective in backing up or questioning the Hong Kong government, but a mechanism for putting into effect laws and, and decisions, and for the Hong Kong people to show that they can and are capable of running Hong Kong. It's now, it's now more than 22 years since Hong Kong was returned to Chinese sovereignty. Um, it's now a special part, it's, it's a unique part, but it is a part, nevertheless, as the noble Lord, Lord Howell said, of the People's Republic of China. There have been a number of references made by noble lords to the joint declaration. My impression, like the noble lord lords assume, is that the only clear-cut case of the breaking of the joint declaration has been the bookseller in Hong Kong, Li Bo, who was, without doubt, taken out of Hong Kong without legal process. He was kidnapped and taken to Hong Kong. But it would be interesting if the noble lord, the minister, could say whether the British government thinks that there have been other straightforward occasions of breaking of the joint declaration. I think it's worth saying, my lords, that um, although it's possible to say, as allegedly, no, as some Chinese officials have said, that the joint declaration is no longer applicable, if you refer to the joint declaration as being just that bit, which says that Britain will return to China sovereignty over Hong Kong, only if you say that, the vast bulk of the joint declaration is in its annexes, and its annexes lay down in terms what are the policies of the People's Republic of China towards Hong Kong for 50 years. That is where in great detail, my lord, is written down precisely what that means. There are Chinese policies laid down there, and that remains applicable. It cannot not remain applicable. Just to revert, if I may, to 
our own role since we no longer administer I'm sorry to intervene. Um, I did um, extend the generosity with, it, with consulting the whips that um, uh, we had um, heard longer than the time from the other former uh, Ge Governor General of Hong Kong. But if I'm so sorry. the Noble Law could now wrap up, although yes, we are I'm not right. tight on time, I do want to be equal to both. I'm so sorry. I, <laughs> I, 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 I will wrap up. Um, what, I, what I would just like to say is we cannot and should not try to tell the Hong Kong government what to do. But we can hope for various things to happen. One would be a commission to look at the whole issue, which the noble Lord, Lord Patton, referred to. We share the position of being the only two survivors of an extinct species, the governors of Hong Kong. And there are other things which could help to resolve the present situation. We must all hope it will be resolved soon for the good of Hong Kong and for all the people who live there. Well, I thank the noble Lord, Lord Alton for securing this debate and for introducing it so powerfully. And he is indeed a formidable champion of human rights worldwide, our conscience in the Lords, clearly. And this has been a passionate and extremely well-informed debate. And we are especially fortunate to have had the contributions of the noble Lords, Lords Patton and Wilson, with their different perspectives, maybe, um, on, on Hong Kong, and also from Lord Luce, as well as from Lord Wei, with his family background. And we're also privileged, it seems to me, to be joined today by a number of young people, yeah. in particular young people, who are quietly listening to our debate. I'm not supposed to be referring to them, and I'm not, <laughs> and who I gather are from Hong Kong. And we also have a former LegCo member here, and again, I'm not referring to him, am I? And like my noble friends, Lord Chiji and Baroness Smith, I have also received a series of individual and very cogent emails from those in Hong Kong. And I share the huge concern expressed today about Hong Kong. It is indeed a beautiful and dynamic place. And I first visited in the mid 1980s and I was on my way to an academic conference in Japan, which turned out to be much uh, duller um, on, the, on the slopes of Mount Fuji, but not quite as exciting as as, as the visit to Hong Kong. So I was very much blown away by my visit to Hong Kong, and I still feel that excitement, even though the, the airport there is somewhat less terrifying than it used to be. But my last visit was a year ago, and that was before the current protests, but you could see the challenges below the surface. In 1997, one third of Chinese GDP was from Hong Kong. Now it is 3% reflecting the growth of the mainland, and that is a worrying statistic. It can also be argued that this undervalues Hong Kong, and Lord Sassoon has made that point to me, um, because um, of, the, of, of its position as a financial centre. 70% of RMB are traded in Hong Kong, and three quarters of foreign direct investment comes via Hong Kong. And I hear, indeed, what the noble Lord, Lord Sassoon says about Hong Kong's current leading position. Hong Kong is a rules-based system, has a rules-based system which is valued internationally, and that has been vital for Hong Kong, for China and the world. My noble friend Lord Alderdice stated that businesses will leave, should leave, should be encouraged to leave if things don't improve. Clearly, the current position is unsustainable. And it was fascinating to hear Lord Patton on how challenging but imaginative was that Sino-British declaration. And that declaration is a treaty lodged at the UN. Yet this year, as other noble lords have mentioned, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson described the handover treaty as a historical document which no longer has any practical significance. Is that spokesperson still in place? And if he is, what does this say about China's position? The extradition treaty, which was the initial trigger, not the overall cause of the protests, has now been fully withdrawn by Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam. But the protests show little sign of letting up. Clashes and violence have escalated, as we've heard. Satellite photos show what appear to be armored personnel carriers across the border in Shenzhen. There are now reports that the Chinese government is planning to replace Carrie Lam with an interim chief executive. Any such change must be accompanied by reform in Hong Kong and not the opposite. 
There's still been no independent investigation into police violence, despite the UK government apparently urging this. Does the noble lord, the minister, accept that the UK government should now suspend all export licences for crowd control equipment to Hong Kong? The noble lord, Lord Hogan Howe, mentioned the police. In response to a written question from my colleague in the other place, Alistair Carmichael, the government said that we are providing training to the police force in Hong Kong. If that is still the case, what steps are being taken to ensure that this training includes the need to uphold human rights and freedom of expression? Now we have the chief executive using emergency powers and many noble lords make reference to this. The ban on face masks is a serious breach of freedom of assembly and the right to protest, as others have said. Does the noble lord the minister agree that the use of emergency powers is a clear breach of the declaration. The EU issued a démarche a few months ago because there was a risk to EU nationals from the extradition treaty. Will the UK encourage the EU to issue a second démarche on the Chief Executive's new powers? What are we doing to work with our EU allies? The events of recent months, alongside Chinese government claims that the joint declaration is no longer a valid document, pose a serious challenge. The noble lord, Lord Luce, spoke of trust and how vital that was and is. My noble friend, Lord Ashdown, led a campaign 20 years ago to give the people of Hong Kong British citizenship, including the right to abode, if China ever reneged on its promises. Does the noble lord not think we've reached that point? The concerns that those in Hong Kong have are informed by the human rights abuses that are known to have taken place on the mainland. The noble lord, Lord Alton, has mentioned a number of these, the lack of freedom of expression, Tiananmen Square, what has happened to certain booksellers. And most recently, we have had the report from the China Tribunal on forced organ harvesting in China. The chair of that tribunal, Sir Geoffrey Nice, is present here today. And that tribunal concluded that in relation to organ harvesting, and I quote, the commission of crimes against humanity against the Falun Gong and the Uyghurs has been proved beyond reasonable doubt. The noble ladies, Baroness Finley and Baroness Gray Thompson, laid out the tribunal's appalling conclusions. Could the noble lord tell me if he has personally read the China tribunal's report, and if he hasn't, whether he will go away and do so? because this isn't going to be an issue that goes away. And if he has, what action the UK government will take on the matter, particularly as he is human rights minister. China has made astonishing progress over the last few decades, pulling people out of poverty and engaging on the world stage. It is producing extraordinarily able students who are studying around the world, including in this country, including at the clearly wonderful university over which the noble Lord, Lord Patton, presides. China is the superpower of the 21st century, but with that power should come responsibility. In what may seem the microcosm of Hong Kong, how China wields that power may become apparent. We know that China has responded to criticism of engagement in Latin America and Africa. It's vital for all of us that we engage globally when so many other pressures seem to be on us to turn inwards and put up barriers. What China does in Hong Kong matters. What the UK, as it contemplates Brexit, does in this circumstance matters. So I look forward to the noble Lord, the Minister's reply. Yeah. Yeah. Like many Lords I am before me, I too would like to thank um, Lord Alton for securing um, this debate. And it follows on from a number of oral questions and private notice questions that have been debated and discussed in this House um, over the last few months. The relationship between the people of the UK and the people of Hong Kong is one built not only on the foundations of our history, but also on shared principles. And as I understand it, with 170,000 British passport holders currently living or working in Hong Kong, and up to 100,000 Hong Kong nationals in the UK, we remain very much interconnected.
today. For those reasons and others, it came as no surprise that this House has taken such a great interest in recent events. And having listened to Noble Lord speak in today's debate, it's clear that the insight that this House can offer um, on Hong Kong is likely unparalleled. And I do hope that the, both the Hong Kong and the Chinese governments are listening into this debate and many of the issues, concerns um, that have been raised. As we near close to five months of widespread political unrest in, Kong, in Hong Kong, the situation seems to escalate almost in each passing week. Earlier this month, we heard the shocking news of live ammunition being used against protesters. And although I've not been made aware of any other reoccurrences, there have been repeated reports of beatings of peaceful protesters, aid personnel and of journalist, journalists. And as, I'm, as well as the attacks with batons and the misuse of non-lethal weapons, indeed only last week the police responded to protester, protesters with an onslaught of rubber bullets, tear gas and baton charges. As this weekend comes upon us, I do worry of what could result from any further clashes between the protesters and the police. So, in the immediate term, I hope the Noble Lord the Minister can assure the House that he is urging restraint from the Hong Kong authorities and will be taking all necessary steps to persuade the authorities to show restraint and end this violent escalation. And on the issue of human rights, I would be grateful if the Noble Lord the Minister could confirm if the government are exploring any opportunities or any options to urge the authorities to respect the freedom of assembly. This principle and other rights are enshrined by the international convention and law and there can be no excuse for any infringements. And of course, as Lord Patton said earlier, we all condemn um, any protesters that have turned to violence, especially during the events of the last weekend, when, as we saw, a very small number <coughs> crossed that line and turned to violence, with a few targeting businesses that had been deemed to be pro-Beijing. But at their core, the protesters have been peaceful, and the cause which ignited the unrest ultimately remains unresolved. On the 26th of September, in the other place, the Foreign Secretary was asked about an independent inquiry, and he responded, the administration in Hong Kong have not gone the full way we would like them to, but they have taken steps to reform and reinforce the independence of the Police Complaints Council. So could I ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, if he could update us, because that was um, earlier in September, and if there had been any advancements or any further pressure put on the Hong Kong government with regards to an independent investigation or an independent inquiry. Although the proposed amendments to allow the Hong Kong Special Administration region to extradite <coughs> individuals to mainland China to face trial has been withdrawn, there is still immense frustration at their initial introduction and the manner in which the authorities proceeded with them. Now, Lord Wilson is correct with regards to the intent of the original extradition laws, as well as correct in his analysis that they were ill-conceived measures. But rightly or wrongly, there is concern that those changes would either be or fear that those changes could be the thin end of a wedge or they could lead, um, if changed in the future, 
to individuals in Hong Kong who had either on social media or in other ways criticised the Chinese government um, being extradited to mainland. And as we heard earlier, the judicial system in mainland China records a conviction rate of in excess of 99%. So there is clearly a lack of trust um, that has led to um, these issues. We also cannot separate the issue of the Sino-British Joint Declaration and its associated democratic <coughs> foundations set out um, so well in 1984. In recent years, China has, steadily, has been steadily eroding and undermining the Joint Declaration. There have been increasing restrictions on electoral rights, crackdowns on dissent, with pro-democracy can um, candidates being disqualified and the Hong Kong National Party being banned in September last year by the government. We must remember that the people are protesting in the streets of Hong Kong simply for their judicial independence, their human rights and their democratic freedoms. These are three principles which the 1984 agreement was designed to protect. And as Lord Alton said in his introduction to this debate, we have a moral and legal obligation to the people of Hong Kong. And yet, despite the UK's responsibility to stand up for the declaration, the government have remained not quite silent, but qu too quiet. And it would be good to hear um, the Prime Minister speak up and stand firm in defence of the declaration. Could I ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, to encourage the Prime Minister to do just so? Like me, I am sure many Lords I am participating in today's debate received emails from Hong Kongers. I do wonder if the situation worries, worsens in Hong Kong, whether we would be able to hear in future from those individuals. Would it be possible for them, or would they feel comfortable emailing and contacting members of this parliament to outline their concerns and their plight? So, in conclusion, as all noble lords have said, it is in the interests of both the people of Hong Kong and the authorities for a resolution to be found. But the groundwork for such a resolution can only be found if the authorities immediately practice restraint and respect for the primacy of the Hong Kongers' human rights. I hope that Her Majesty's Government will now use its role on the global stage and our unique relationship to urge both the authorities, both Hong Kong and China, to do so. My Lords, may I firstly join with all Noble Lords in thanking the Noble Lord, Lord Orton, for tabling this important debate. Many words have been used about Lord Orton, and rightly so. I don't always, I probably perhaps stand before you as the person who is most greatly challenged, at least from a parliamentary perspective, by the tenacity but also the great strength and expertise the Noble Lord brings to debates in respect of human rights generally. But he also knows, I'm sure, that I respect his insights and very much welcome the input, expertise and also direction that he gives and indeed advises on. And I'm very grateful again for his contribution to this important debate. May I start in aligning myself very much with the words of my noble friend Lord Sassoon, and I'm sure I speak for all noble lords in your Lordship's house when we stand together in remembrance and in prayer of the 39 nationals who've been reported to have died in the incident in the lorry. We're all equally appalled by this tragic incident, and I'm sure I speak in expressing our condolences to all the families of those victims on behalf of your Lordship's House. My Lords, um, I, I noted with one of our newer members, the noble Lady Baroness Bennett, who is the first opportunity to hear from her. I listened very carefully on the advice she was given about foreign affairs and being all-consuming 
When you're the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, you don't have much choice in the matter. But I'm sure she will agree with me that when you hear the debates of the quality we have today, that she will also agree that your Lordship's House provides great insight and expertise on important matters confronting the government, confronting our country and the challenges, but also the role of Her Majesty's Government on the world stage. And I welcomed her contribution. But in particular, I'm sure noble lords, as was said by the noble lady Baroness Northover, will join with me, particularly singling out the contributions of my noble friend Lord Patton and the noble lord, Lord Wilson. They brought experience, insight and expertise, as with other noble lords, but their value of serving in Hong Kong, I think, is very worth noting. And I listened very carefully to their contributions, particularly on how we should move forward in what is clearly a very challenging situation in Hong Kong now. And I thank both noble lords and, indeed, your lordship's indulgence. I think it was right that we heard on extended time from both noble lords in terms of their contributions. I'm particularly grateful for my noble friend Baroness Berridge for ensuring that was done in a seamless fashion. My lords, it's been the long-standing interest in Hong Kong of your Lordship's House, and rightly so, again, in the debate today, we have seen concerns being raised on the ongoing situation, both in your Lordship's House as well as the other place. And indeed, in the writing, the correspondence that we've received from members of Parliament and your Lordship's House on this issue, and as the noble Lady Baroness Northover, amongst others, said, that we've received from other parts, and many who I know will be listening very intently to this debate today. The Government shares the concern of the Noble Lord Alton and indeed all Noble Lords about the situation and particularly about the violent clashes between protesters and the police. The Noble Lord McNichol said about whether the Government is taking strides and is raising this issue and I hope he will be assured by some of my uh, responses today that, that we are doing just that. Uh, my Noble Friend Lord Marsford described Hong Kong rightly as once upon a time a real flourishing city. And I think we all reflect on its times and with hope and ambition that that will again be the case in the not too distant future. May I also say that I agree with, my, with the noble Lord, Lord Carrington, and my noble friend, Baroness Hooper, when they drew attention to the importance of peaceful and lawful protests, but also recognizing that anyone who resorts to violent action should be rightly condemned. It is right that the majority of citizens in Hong Kong over many months have exercised their right to protest and have done so through peaceful and lawful protests, and I think that needs to be recognized. But equally, I'm sure I speak for everyone in your Lordship's House that we condemn the hardcore minority of protesters who at times insist on using violence. As the noble Lord Wilson reminded us that the police who have shown restraint in many instances have also witnessed directly attacks on them. We've seen the use of petrol bombs and in recent days a police officer also being slashed with a knife. This violence, uh, as the noble Lord, <coughs> Lord, <coughs> no, noble Lord Carrington rightly said, must stop. Many noble lords have taught... <coughs> Make one point to, the, to my uh, honourable friend. Um, there have been criticisms of policing, but the real problem here is the public order of policing has been regarded by the government as a substitute for politics. Tear gas isn't a substitute for talking to people and trying to deal with their real grievances. And I think that's put the police and police families in a very difficult position. I totally <coughs> concur with my noble friend. He is, of course, right, and I think um, and that is why. The ultimate solution to the challenge we face is, of course, dialogue, political dialogue, and I will come on to uh, speaking exactly on that point in a moment or two. The noble lady, Baroness Northover, raised some specific questions on the situation on the ground in terms of uh, the emergency powers, if I could just deal with those from the outset. Um, while governments, of course, need to ensure security and safety of people, we must avoid, as noble Lord, my noble friend just uh, reminded us of aggravating and instead reduce tensions. Um, she asked about the introduction of emergency regulations as to whether that was a breach of the do joint declaration. Certainly our assessment uh, thus far is not a breach, while governments though need to ensure that the security and safety of their people remain paramount. They must, as I said, avoid aggravating and reducing tension. 
She also asked about the issue of crowd control equipment to Hong Kong. Um, as my right hon. friend, the former Foreign Secretary, stated during his remarks in the House of Commons in, on the 25th of June, no further export licence will be granted for crowd control equipment to Hong Kong until such time that we are satisfied that concerns raised around human rights and fundamental freedoms have been thoroughly addressed. The noble lady also raised the issue of police training. Um, the police training for all security and justice programmes, as she will be aware, is used uh, with an additional risk management process to assess and to mitigate human rights. Our aim of our training that we have provided to Hong Kong is to improve foreign authorities' ability to deploy human rights compliant modern policing techniques. It's a fine balance, but we're keeping that situation particularly under review. Um, the noble Lord Wilson uh, talked also of the breach of, joint, joint, of the joint declaration, as did my noble friend Lord Sassoon. Um, and they both rightly pointed out uh, of the one state, two systems continuing and continuing well. And the, give, the government, Her Majesty's government, has not assessed to date that China has explicitly breached the joint declaration, with the exception of one particular case, um, which is well documented. My Lords, the police response, which was also raised by several noble lords, including the expert contribution we had from the noble lord, Lord Hogan Howe, where he asked particularly about the reports of sexual assault by the Hong Kong police. This was also a concern expressed by the noble lady, Baroness Bennett. I am aware of these reports, and we remain extremely concerned by the reports of violence by the police. We also note that the Hong Kong police have announced that it's investigating a recent allegation from a university student in particular, and that the student herself has said that she is seeking legal advice, and we will continue to monitor that particular situation. But the response, as I said, from the police, we've always said it, and sustained this position, must be proportionate, and we are seriously concerned by the instances of apparent mistreatment of protesters by the police. But I do, of course, note the words of my noble friend Lord Patton in this respect. We believe, and the noble Lord, my noble friends Lord Patton, my noble friends Lord Howell, amongst others, the noble Lord Hogan Howell, the noble Lord Luce, all raised the issue of the police inquiry. Indeed, several other noble lords did. We retain the fact there must be a robust, credible and independent investigation into these incidents, incidents and we, such an inquiry would be an important step towards healing divisions uh, and rebuilding trust. The noble Lord McNichol asked, are we continuing to raise this in bilaterally with the Chinese authorities? The short answer is yes, yes we are. As I've said before, Her Majesty's Government believes that political dialogue, as several noble lords have expressed, is the only way to achieve a peaceful resolution to this situation. While we have welcomed the Chief Executive's initial steps towards dialogue, it is clear that further clarity is required and further steps need to be taken on how the Chief Executive and her team will reach across communities and address directly the people's concerns. Crucially, if the process is to succeed, it is incumbent upon all to be involved and engaged in good faith. I agree with also my noble friend Lord Sassoon's views on the importance of the One Country, Two Systems framework for the strength and stability it's provided to Hong Kong over the past 22 years. Hong Kong is already a valuable trading partner for the UK, and the UK is for Hong Kong. And we look forward to seeing this trading relationship develop post-Brexit. Similarly, we also enjoy a deep and close deep cooperation with Hong Kong, as do other, as a leading financial centre, which I also hope and expect that we can build on on the further months and years to come. But, my lords, rightly, we have heard about concerns and the need to uphold rights and freedoms. This was a point made by the noble Lord Carrington, <coughs> and indeed uh, others. Well, let me assure the, uh, the noble Lord um, Alton also raised this particular issue, and in particular I was taken by the contribution of the noble Lord, Lord Alderdice, who talked about businesses working in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a city I know well as a, someone who spent 20 years in the city of London and dealt with Hong Kong on a r regular basis. But the fact is that those ties are important. As a co-signatory, however, to the Sino-British Joint Declaration, the UK is committed to promoting and upholding the rights, freedoms and autonomies that are enshrined within it. And let me assure the noble Lord, Lord Alderdice, we are working intensively in recent weeks and months to support a positive resolution, and those factors will be sustained and will continue to be part of our dialogue in this respect. 
Uh, several noble lords <coughs> raised the issue of uh, the Prime Minister's direct engagement on this issue. Indeed, the Lord Lord, Lord McNichol uh, mentioned it quite specifically. Noble Lords will recall that the Prime Minister raised Hong Kong specifically at the G7 meeting in August, and G7 uh, leaders reaffirmed the importance of the joint declaration and called for an end to violence. This also addresses in part the issue raised by the Noble Lady Baroness Smith. Furthermore, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has also written to President Xi on the 30th of September and underlined the importance of upholding the joint declaration under the One Country, Two Systems framework. My right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, has also set out our concerns directly in his engagement with the Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam and the Chinese Foreign Minister, State Councillor Wang Yi. Although, regrettably, uh, he was unable to meet Foreign Minister Wang Yi at the UN General Assembly as planned for he needed to return to London. But following this, the Foreign Secretary did write to him on the 30th of September, and we continue with regular exchanges with both the Chinese and the Hong Kong authorities specifically. Um, on the issue of uh, which my noble friend Baroness Hooper raised about European partners, as did the noble lady Baroness Faulkner, as I've already said, we've met with uh, and meet with G7 partners on a regular basis. And we also raised Hong Kong at the Human Rights Council in September and at the Third Committee of the UN General Assembly in October, where the UK underlined the importance of upholding the right to peaceful assembly. If I may, if I can move on to the important issues which were raised around the aspects of human rights, because it is an area which is, as noble lords will know, is very close to my heart, and it's important we address them. And <clears throat> we continue to address these at ambassadorial level. The most recent meeting with the Chinese ambassador in London was earlier this week. Um, <clears throat> we also have raised with the leadership in China and Hong Kong regularly that they remain in no doubt over our concerns over the current situations. Um, the issue of the Commonwealth was raised, and in recent exchanges that we've had on the issue of Hong Kong, including those by my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, these have included exchanges with Australian Foreign Minister Payne uh, and also with other European counterparts as well. At the United Nations, for which I am the minister responsible, we raised Hong Kong in our national statement to the September session of Human Rights Council, and last week we underlined the importance of upholding the right to peaceful assembly in a national statement to the UN General Assembly. Um, if I can pick up on some specific issues, the Noble Lord Alton, the Noble Lady Baroness Finlay, and the Noble Lady Baroness Grey Thompson all raised the issue of the Falun Gong and the practitioners. Uh, the Noble Lady Baroness Northover asked me specifically about the tribunal, and I note the presence in the gallery of Sir Geoffrey Nice. I had the occasion to meet with him very recently to discuss this very issue, and let me assure the Noble Lady, indeed all Noble Lords, that we are aware of the, the findings. Uh, there is a final report still due, but we are watching this space very carefully, and I know I'm very much, if I may, again mention the Noble Lord Alton specifically uh, uh, had various exchanges on this particular issue. This is not lost on us. This is an important priority, and I assure Noble Lords that I will continue as the Human Rights Minister to keep a specific uh, eye on this particular issue. On the wider issues that were raised on religious freedoms in China, um, again by the Noble uh, Lady uh, Baroness Finley, by the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Salisbury, and the Noble Lord Lord Ordenice, amongst others, let me assure all Noble Lords that this again remains both a priority for Her Majesty's Government as well as for myself as Minister for Human Rights. We have not held back. We have quite regularly raised the issue of uh, human rights and religious freedoms in our expressions and statements and formal contributions, particularly at the Human Rights Council. And of course, I recognise the immense work uh, that has gone on on the issue of addressing the concerns around the Falun Gong issue in particular. But equally, we have remained deeply concerned and have raised the concerns about the persecution of Christians, the Uyghur Muslims, and other minorities within China, and we will continue to do so. In terms of, I think I've answered that particular one, the Noble Lord Alton also asked about the question of uh, the sanctions regime. Um, as was Noble Lords will recall, we have passed legislation to this effect. We are certainly seeking to bring these statutory instruments forward, and that will 
provide the UK with an autonomous global human rights sanctions regime after we've left the European Union, and this will allow us to respond to serious human rights violations as well. My Lords, I'm conscious of time, so I want to move forward, if I may, uh, to the issue of the right of abode. Rightly, this was raised by several noble Lords, uh, by <coughs> including my noble friend Lord Poppert, and the noble Lady Baroness Smith, and the noble Lord Alton. The noble Lord Alton asked me specifically about numbers. There are currently 248,000 holders of BNO. However, there are 2.73 million who are eligible for BNO status. I note the points raised, of course, by all noble lords in this respect, and I would like to emphasise that this government's commitment to and support for British nationals uh, overseas, known as the BNOs. As my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, set out in the other place on the 26th of September, the status of BNOs was part of the delegate balance in negotiations that led to the Sino British Joint Declaration. The Joint Declaration is crucial to the future stability and prosperity of Hong Kong and the rights and freedoms and autonomy of its people. But equally, I would add, it's, this only applies effectively for both sides to respect what is within the agreement. Let me assure the Right Reverend Prelate, amongst others, that we believe that the best outcome for the BNOs is, of course, a high degree of autonomy and rights and freedoms set out in the Joint Declaration quite specifically. The Noble Lord Chiji raised this particular issue, as did others. Indeed, my noble friend Lord Howell, the noble Lord Lord Luce, my noble friend Lord Malsford, and the noble Lord Lord Wei, who provided particular insight with his own background in Hong Kong, talked of reforms within Hong Kong. The way forward must be, and I think we're all clear on that, first and foremost, as my noble friend Lord Patton said, about constructive and meaningful dialogue with all communities. Those bridges must be built to address their concerns quite directly. And of course, our long-standing view is that transition to universal suffrage for both the elections of the Chief Executive and the Legislative Council, as provided, I would add, as provided by Hong Kong's law, basic law, would be the best way to guarantee Hong Kong's stability and prosperity in the long run, and would be in everyone's interests. Therefore, <coughs> my, as I've said before, we do and are taking the issue of the BNOs very seriously, and I know and I can put this that, and share with noble lords that the Foreign Secretary, my Right Honourable Foreign Secretary, the Right Honourable Foreign Secretary and his ministerial counterparts are listening to the concerns which are being expressed. Uh, the Government is not immune from receiving the representations. We have received those directly, and we will be considering the best way forward to continue to support and strengthen our work with the BNO community directly. The Government has given careful consideration to the Noble Lord Lord Alton's letter of the 9th of September, which was also signed, I believe, by 176 Noble Lords and other parliamentary colleagues. And I welcome the broad spectrum of support for Hong Kong and its peoples, and note the points which have been raised. With specific regards to the countries of the Commonwealth, I must underline, of course, it would be out of my remit to talk about the immigration policy of other Commonwealth countries. But I reiterate my view that it is the best way for any like-minded countries to support BNOs is to defend the joint declaration, which they are doing, and we have received strong support for that, including, as I said, in discussions we've had with other Commonwealth partners, most notably recently with Australia. Um, on the issue of Hong Kong servicemen, which the Noble Lord Luce raised, a number of Noble Lords have raised the status of former members of the Hong Kong Military Service Corps, let me assure the Noble Lord that I know the Home Secretary is listening very carefully to the representations that have been made on behalf of those former Hong Kong Military Service Corps personnel who were unable to obtain citizenship through the selection scheme. Uh, the Noble Lord Pendry rightly raised the issue of Hong Kong uh, in terms of Hong Kong students who are studying in the UK. My short answer is very much that anyone who is intimidated by any bullying, it is frankly and utterly unacceptable. Universities have a duty of care to protect all students, and if there are particular instances, I would certainly urge the Noble Lord to make the Government aware of these. Um, there was a final question from the Noble Lady Baroness Smith on, Newham on the issue of unexplained suicide. This is a very sensitive situation, and I am aware of this particular situation. Indeed, we have had one formal request from 
uh, one family and urge people not to speculate on the reasons behind these issues. They are obviously very tragic circumstances for the family, but if there are further details in this respect, I will share with the noble lady. Finally, the noble Lord Chigi and the noble lady Baroness Great Thompson, amongst others, my noble friend Lord Popper, talked about the Chinese view on the joint declaration and describing it as a historic document. Well, the short answer from Her Majesty's Government is absolutely not. The joint declaration is a legally binding treaty registered at the UN. It remains in force, and as a co-signatory, we have the right, we have the absolute right to speak out when we have concerns about the implementation of the joint declaration. And let me assure noble lords, we will continue to consistently make this point in public and indeed bilaterally and in private to the Chinese government. May I once again thank all noble lords for their very insightful but expert contributions to what have been, has been a very comprehensive debate. And let me assure noble lords that we will continue to update noble lords. I'm sure there will be questions asked of me, uh, and I will look to update noble lords in this respect as and when we have further updates to provide. But ultimately, I'm sure we are very much all committed to encouraging all parties directly concerned, the Hong Kong administration, the Chinese government, indeed all international partners, to do all they can to ultimately realize and uphold this peaceful vision of a thriving Hong Kong, a thriving China, under the one country, two systems model. I will we'll be grateful to the noble Lord, Lord Armand of Wimbledon, the Minister of State, for the thorough way in which he has just answered the issues which have been raised, but also the promise to come back and to keep us briefed on developments as they occur. The noble Lord, echoing Lord Sassoon, reminded us of the tragic news that the 39 people who have been found dead in a lorry were of Chinese origin. We don't yet know their story, but we do know that they shared our humanity. Shared humanity has been a theme which has informed every contribution in today's debate. Many noble lords have referred to moving correspondence from Hong Kong. I received an email from a lady this morning who said, I don't know if you will really read my email, but please do try to do something so people know the pain we are suffering in Hong Kong. I think, my lords, that our speeches right across the chamber today from every part of your lordship's house have demonstrated that we have listened, that we have heard, and we have tried to articulate some of that pain. In a range of knowledgeable and measured speeches, we've heard considerable support for finding an international approach to providing an insurance policy of second citizenship and a second right of abode. We've heard universal support for two systems, one country, and yet we've also heard how it's been emasculated. Yesterday I met Alan Long, a barrister, one of the leaders of the Hong Kong political party, who set out a number of examples where he believed that the 1984 agreement has indeed been breached. My Lords, we've spoken with depth, with knowledge, with passion and with commitment. All of us have said that the best way forward, and the point that the noble Lord, Lord Patton made so, so well, we must try to find ways that do not involve violence, that take us forward and ensure that there are constructive solutions found, political answers, as were found in 1984 in what all of us, I think, have referred to as really an act of diplomatic genius. I think, to paraphrase something that the noble Lord, Lord Howell of Guildford said to us earlier on, I hope that the lady who wondered whether her email would be read or whether we understood the pain of Hong Kong will have heard our debate today. And that, like the young people, who we're not supposed to mention, but the noble Baroness Lady Northover quite rightly did, and who've packed our galleries, will know that they and their concerns have not been forgotten. It is a signal from a great and free Parliament that we will not forget our historic, our moral and our legal responsibilities. This Parliament will not be silenced in its responsibilities to safeguard two systems, one country, the rule of law, democracy, human rights, free speech and autonomy. Let me end. We must always replace fear with hope, indifference with solidarity and never neglect our common humanity. It only remains for me once again to thank all noble lords who have spoken so eloquently today. Does this motion be agreed to? Many of that have been in the second tent. Contrary not, content, the content of it. My Lords, I beg to move that the House do now adjourn. That the House do now adjourn. <laughs>